All right, friends, welcome. It is great to have you here today for Onyx Intermediate, a continuation of yesterday's beginner webinar. We're going to be talking about a lot of great things today. First thing I would love to know, of course, we're already getting to this a little bit in the chat, I see, is where are you today? And go ahead, feel free to open up Onyx on a different screen while you do that. We'll get going. I definitely recognize some of the names I'm seeing in the chat. And uh, just let me know. I, I see people are uh, writing in where they're from. So I'm sure you can hear me and uh, we're seeing a good connection from Zoom, all that good stuff, which is wonderful. Um, I love about these webinars. Cool thing about them is there are just literally people from everywhere here and uh, including Mr. Lopez. Hey, John Lopez. Um, so many great people here from so many places. It's just incredible. It's so cool that we can do that. You know, the internet, man. Um, cool stuff. So let's dive in, guys. Um, what we're going to cover today is um, is uh, completely different from what we did two days ago. So I know a lot of you are here from, from uh, two days ago. Uh, you guys were there and, and you're now here and that's great. If you did miss that webinar, um, we, we are going to have the replay up. It's not quite ready yet, but, but it will be up in the future. You can check that out. So today our focus is going to be, we're going to quickly go over the Onyx hardware overview. We're just going to highlight the stuff that, um, you're going to highlight the hardware, um, not go in depth like we did yesterday, but you know, cover the basics. Then we're going to talk about the licensing because that's a, a hot topic. And, and if you weren't here yesterday, or maybe you're just looking for a, a little refresh uh, from two days ago, we can do that. Uh, then we're going to spend the majority of our time, like you know, 90% of our time, in the software. Today, we're, we're looking at the intermediate level stuff. And so we're really going to focus in on the 2D plan and the integration with Capture that's in this current version and in the future through CITP. We're also going to go deep into customizing your windows and, and the F keys and show you some tips and tricks and things you may not have known you're able to do in there. We're going to talk about cloning, another hot topic. And if you don't know what cloning is, uh, most of you probably do uh, if you guys are designer, lighting designers, lighting people. But if you don't, it's, it's a really great way. You can really shortcut your programming on a lot of shows with it. And I use it on every show that I do. Um, then we have, uh, we're going to talk about selecting, loading, and editing. Might seem, uh, you know, not like the most exciting thing, but it really is because it will speed you up. It will make you a better programmer. It will help you to work faster. Now, for folks, uh, you know, people have been asking about, and, and we had quite a bit of tech support on the last webinar with connections to capture, things like that. If you have installation problems, anything like that, uh, please go ahead and do that in the chat section and use the question and answer section for questions about the content, about uh, what we're talking about in Onyx. And the question and answer section, this is great, is going to be, uh, is our panelists are going to be helping you out there. So let's talk about our panelists. First of all, I am here, David Henry here from LearnStageLighting.com. I teach people about lighting. I am a lighting designer and I've been doing lighting of all sorts. Uh, we also have here today, Matthias Henricks, product manager of Alation Professional and Obsidian Control Systems. Uh, you want to pop in here, Matthias? And, uh, hey, all. Couple... Yes. Uh, thanks for joining us on the, the second day here. We had a lot of attendees um, uh, on Tuesday. That was great. So I appreciate that. Uh, welcome back to everyone. And if you're the first time here, um, just as you mentioned the rules, uh, like how we'd like to structure this, Q&A should be related to the topics at hand that I get and discussed. Um, uh, use the chat and you can actually, you should be able to pick panelists in the chat down there. If you have any like support question or like, hey, I can't get my capture to work. Um, Bob and I will sort of jump into those so David can continue with um, the, the webinar itself. So we don't get sidetracked here. Um, we are uploading all these webinars and they take a bit longer to edit than we thought um, after cut out a couple of things so that when maybe quite relevant and, and clean them up a bit and then put them online, but we'll try to do it as soon as we can. I actually expect that both of these we have now are going to be up maybe by Monday at the latest. Yeah. So thanks for joining. And I think we're going to have a good three hours here. Awesome. And we also have Bob Mentel here. Do you want to say anything today, Bob? Uh, no, but thanks for, that's, thanks that's for joining right. us, everyone. <laughs> That's all right. All right. So I will pop back over here to my screen. And uh, we have Bob Mentel. He is the vertical 
market manager at Elation Professional. And what he tells me that that means is that he helps people find great solutions and, and works with designers and, and uh, folks who work with lighting and, uh, you know, learns about their needs and brings your needs back to the company to say, hey, this is, this is what our, our people are asking for. And you find solutions to make it work. You can also notice from the photo that when you do see Bob in the flesh at trade shows and whatever, he is definitely the best dressed man in the lighting business. And he uh, makes us all look bad in that regard. So I would love to know real quick in the chat, is who are you and uh, what a type of lighting do you most often work with? So do you work as a lighting designer? Do you work in a church? You know, what, what kind of lighting do you typically do? Um, and what, what, you know, type of uh, shows do you do when we do have shows? I would love to know about that in the chat real quick before we get started. It helps us to really make the webinar work for you guys. Awesome. I'm seeing some results here. Very cool. Great. Very cool. And then as we mentioned before, guys, uh, today's webinar, there's the chat section and the Q&A section. The most important piece being that if it's a question about the content or a clarification or something like that, use the Q&A section. If it's a tech support or you're just saying hi or you're, you know, um, trying to joke with me like Giancarlo does in there, um, you know, keep that to the chat. I'm, I'm going to ignore the chat while I'm teaching because I'm just plain too easily distracted. But for your help and for the needs of um, all the folks in there, um, we're going to have uh, Bob and Matthias uh, constantly watching the chat, the Q&A. They're here to help you guys and they are great. So as we get into today's webinar, what we need you to do is set this full screen if you can on a separate device from what you're doing on. on uh, that would be the best. If, if not, um, either way, remove any distractions you've got. I've got my phone on silent. Uh, yep, just double check that. Um, I would love if you could do the same and I've got my door locked and all that stuff so that the kids don't come running in, you know, and, and bothering me. Uh, and, and if you can do that, that is the best so that you don't miss anything. Of course, as mentioned before, this is being recorded and that recording will be up shortly so you can review it. Um, but we'd hate for you to miss something in the middle and, the, and then come back. So if you can't give us your full attention, that is the best uh, that we can do. Now, on the topic of hardware yesterday, and the replay for that will be available soon if you weren't here, uh, we went over all this hardware. We talked about each piece. There's a lot of great stuff in here. If you're not familiar with the Onyx hardware range, uh, take a minute to go to obsidiancontrol.com. Learn about the hardware. There's a lot of really great stuff in there, and especially uh, when, when you look at the capabilities and the price point and compare it to other products on the market, uh, I think you'll, you'll be um, very excited about what you see there's a lot of really good stuff there. There also is Netron. If you're not familiar, Netron is kind of like the sister brand from Obsidian Control uh, Systems. They are uh, DMX splitters, Ethernet Actually, nodes. Netron is a product range. Like Onyx has a product range with the NX consoles, the Onyx software, and Netron is a product range. They're <laughs> all within Obsidian Control Systems. Yes, I misspoke. Good. Thank you, Matthias. Um, it, yeah, so it's a product range. Uh, the key difference about Netron is, is these are nodes, DMX processing products, etc. cetera. Um, they don't unlock output, but they can be used, obviously, uh, with Onyx and, uh, and are quite effective. So on the licensing side, guys, um, we've got uh, various types of hardware licensing here. So uh, sometimes people get a little bit confused about things. So we're just going to go over the basics here for you today so that you are familiar with it. So uh, what we've got here is this chart here, which is at, in the manual, which is also available at support.obsidiancontrol.com. Um, we've got the consoles down the left and the PC interfaces. And then uh, this tells us about what the DMX ports are that are available and how many universes are unlocked. So we'll see here the NX4 and NX2 consoles, uh, the maximum that they can unlock is 64 universes. That's based on the hardware inside those consoles. Uh, on the PC side, if you're using an NX2 in wing mode, a uh, USB mode, if you're using an NX wing, or if you're using an Onyx key, you get 128 universes unlocked. Um, of course, you need to make sure your processor is uh, capable of handling that. If you are using 128 universes, uh, you cannot use a PC with the minimal specs and expect great results, right? Um, also available, there are the NX Touch and NX DMX, which are uh, USB devices. 
that connect to the PC in free mode. Now, free mode is going to give you those four universes of DMX output um, available. And uh, depending on if you're in the NX Touch, if your free is green, you get full OSC functionality. If your free is red, if you're just using an Ethernet node like a Netron or you're using the NX DMX, then um, then your playbacks will be delayed. Okay, so so do keep that in mind that um, that you can use all the programming buttons via OSC, but via OSC only the um, the playbacks are delayed. Awesome. Now, another question we get a lot, and and, and we can cover quick, this at the uh, end. Quickly here, Dave, before yes. you move on, uh, we did have a question um, about a specific. Um, use case where we had a an installation with over 255 licensed universes and the uh, marshal is asking how how that worked out and just some details about the event i'm not sure if you know much about it but maybe this can chime in quickly uh to give us that answer yeah i do know about it but let's have matthias give the official answer <laughs> just to make sure it's said correctly <laughs> It's a custom license that we generated um, for the specific event um, where we work with the user to build a really high powered PC to drive that. Uh, it was first one that's actually done that. So it's, uh, it'll need some more development work to really open that up for everybody. But eventually we'll be able to up, you know, sell a larger license key if we want to, um, to, to go to a higher universe count. So it was uh, unlocked to 255 universes. And just out of curiosity. Anybody has yeah. something like a project like that, um, reach out to us and we can discuss that one-to-one. -one. But it's like right now it's on an as-needed basis. And it was actually, in this case, it was even time-restricted. So this license was valid for you know three months. And then it will fall back to what it was before, which is under 28 universes. But he had a really powerful PC, like an i9. It was really souped up big graphics cards, but he ran everything from one computer. Everything was in sync from that one uh, device. And that was everything. A lot of it was streamed wirelessly actually to Netron nodes around the um, facility there. Yeah, I did see that. I am curious, Matthias, if you have any benchmarks like during the, while the show was running, like was the PC running at like 20% capacity or was it slamming pretty hard? I'm just honestly curious. And I'm sure uh, others are. He told me it wasn't running a lot. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. Great. There's a lot cool. of dialogue stuff calculated in the uh, graphics card, not in the processor. And i9 was like eight cores, hyper threaded. It was very powerful. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. And so that is licensing, guys. Um, support. So where to find support? So, uh, you know, when you're, when we get off, obviously during today's webinar, you know, we've got the guys in the chat and the Q&A and we're answering your questions. But after today's webinar, where do you go to get more info about Onyx to get questions answered, et cetera, et cetera? Well, the first place is obsidiancontrol.com. We've mentioned this here, and it is um, the kind of the main hub. You see these four buttons here. If you scroll down, it takes you to the download, the fixture library, um, the user guide, which is at support.obsidiancontrol.com, and the YouTube channel where there are various videos of uh, the user manual videos, as well as uh, some other stuff, some of the webinars they've done in the past and stuff are there as well as on the site. Um, so as I mentioned, support.obsidian control is the online user manual. It's also in the software and in the consoles. You're able to go here, reference everything. There's a search function. You can find whatever you need and uh, see examples uh, of how to do things and such. Then we have the Onyx forums also uh, from obsidiancontrol.com. You can get there. It's at forum.obsidiancontrol.com. And this is the tech support forum. So if you're having a tech support type issue, this is the place to go. This is the place they're watching uh, for any kind of issues to answer those, make sure you guys are taken care of. And then there is the group on Facebook. Now the Facebook group is not really a tech support channel. Um, it would be best for you to put that in the, the forum. But this is a great place if you've got questions for other users about, you know, how they structure things or questions about, you know, uh, which console or, or, you know, you've got questions um, that don't really fall under tech support, but are just kind of, huh, I wonder about this. Then this is a great place for that as well. And then uh, depending on where you are in the world and uh, once we get through this time, uh, there will be live trainings again, probably from Alation. There have been in the past, there should be in the future, as well as if you're elsewhere in the world, um, you're 
distributor. And uh, they're a great time to be able to get in there and really dive deep, have that one-on-one -on -one with an instructor and just a uh, small number of classmates on one of the big consoles. Um, and so that is something to take advantage of as well. So let's go ahead guys and hop on in to the software. I'm gonna pop over to Onyx here. Um, hopefully you guys have logged in as well. We've got Onyx up and running here. And what we're gonna do here is today to start off, I wanna go ahead, we've had a lot of questions about the capture integration. And so we're gonna walk through that and show you even more of how that integration works, okay? Um, and so that's what we're going to do right here, guys. Um, so I'm going to move Onyx over here, and I'm going to open up the demo file that came in the download for Capture. If you don't know where those are, you didn't get them beforehand, um, do ask the guys in the chat. They can post a link. So here we've got the demo system. Uh, Bob Mentel made this file, and we are thankful for it. He made a good one. And, um, and so I've loaded this first, and now I want to go into Onyx and create a new show, okay? If you've loaded a new show before, it's going to give you this. It's going to tell you about how it's backing up your old show. And I'm just going to call this webinar 128. Awesome. We'll let that load here. And then we'll go over, I know a lot of you are doing this in the chat, but what we have to have turned on to make sure we're connecting to Capture. Awesome, so we'll go up to the Onyx menu here and you see I had this little pop-up come up that says CITP and has a description about capture being connected. So you're good to go. Uh, what I've done here is as we went over yesterday, we're gonna go into the Onyx menu in the menu here, is I have the uh, Microsoft loopback adapter installed. That's something that's built into your PC, but you do have to install it, you have to enable it. And they can walk you through that support if you need it. Um, and what we do is we use that um, as our Ether DMX interface, we can send our SACN down it and then also turn on our CITP right here. And we turn it on on that interface. So we make sure CITP is on. We make sure um, that uh, our Ether DMX is on. And then in the settings and interfaces, we can double check. We can click on our Ether DMX here and it's going to show us if this window's bigger. It, uh, it's a little bit different there. Um, it's going to show us that our CITP is on, and we'll, we'll make sure that's turned on there and press apply. Once you do that, you should be able to launch Capture, the demo file, and then see that little window that pops up that says, I'm good. You know, I've got, Onyx says I've got Capture connected, and in the CITP window here, we see Capture here, and it's got a little green light next to it, which tells us we're offline, or we're online, rather, which is exactly what we're looking for. Um, then on the Capture side, if things aren't working, you can go to window. This is a uh, capture demo file presentation file. So it's a little bit different than the full version of capture, but we go in here to universes. And if we drag this out, what we'll see is the external universes are all universe zero through whatever um, connected here to Onyx. If we click more and connectivity options, if you are having issues connecting, what we like to do is go over here to CITP and actually pick the ethernet adapter that we're using um, instead of having it on automatic and, and that usually clears up any issue that there might be, okay? Um, so those guys are connected, they're good. And uh, just let me know in the chat real quick when, uh, if you guys are connected uh, like this from uh, Capture to Onyx. Connected, awesome, very cool, great. Cool, we're seeing some people connected. Once again, if you're having an issue, hop in the chat, ask, and uh, you can chat one-to-one -one with Bob or Matthias and they'll get it worked out, great. Um, so what we're gonna do now, this is the cool part. So we just launched a blank file, right, in Onyx, and we've got, in Capture, we've got a system. So this is the, the way that it's working um, into the future where you can go into Capture, design in 3D, build your rig, patch it, and then just bring it straight into Onyx. Let's, let's see how. So we're gonna go up here to Onyx, go to patch. And if you've used Onyx before, you'll notice this import button here. 
and then there's a scan over CITP. So I'm going to go ahead and press that. It takes just a minute and then it goes and finds all the things. Boom. And so here we get all of the data that's patched in Capture right now. And it does tell us too if there's issues, um, if there's any funkiness here. Like, like here it's telling us, uh, what's it telling us about these fuse pendants? I believe it's telling us that uh, that they have the same fixture and unit number. Yeah, that's what it is. That in in Capture they're using the same. Um, in the full version of Capture, you can see they have the same. What is it? I think channel and unit number, and, and it's not a huge deal there. It just uh, gets them in there twice. And so what we can then do is do import all, and then it says, hey, we've got conflicts here again. That's these fuse pendants where the ID and the channel are both set in capture and that's what's causing them to show up twice, but never fear, it figures it out and it says, hey, we're only gonna import one of them. And so you do this and, and this is cool because in capture, you know, in this file, Bob went and created this and it's got everything patched with addresses and universes. So it's going in here and you can see the progress bar across the top and you can do this as well. Um, and then you're gonna go ahead and, uh, you're gonna go ahead and watch everything come in. You may also get this window that says uh, unassigned channels detected and I'm just gonna say load factory default and yes, when that comes up, let that all come together. Awesome. Didn't yeah, love that. These two are undefined that you're seeing there. So I'll just put them in beam or in something for now. Yeah. So with the new library, um, I'm actually still working on Probably not in framing those two. They probably belong in beam effects. Okay, I'll put them back. So yeah, as, as Matthias was noting out, usually when you see this error, you can hit load default and everything will find their place. But these ones are part of the capture cameras, I believe, or something like that. And so they're still working on getting them in. So beam effects, if you click over to that um, on this top bar. Yeah, it's gonna happen on our custom fixture profiles too. Like, you, you know, the, that there's a channel name that's not known. So the console asks, where do you want it? And that's all it is. And this is actually a similar window. It can be found in the window after a menu to reorganize it if you made a mistake here. So not that. Not yeah, that it's, not, it's not fatal if you put it in the wrong place here by any means. <laughs> you can move it around anytime. Awesome, very cool. So, and so then once you, can, you get that, those in there, you can press apply and then you're good to go. And so now at this point, we've actually got all these fixtures here from the import tab and they're over in the patch tab now and we're patched. Um, it really was that simple, but it doesn't end there. So um, the first note on the patch for those who weren't here yesterday with the capture integration over CITP, um, part of that change in Onyx is a new fixture library because Onyx is now using the same fixture library that Capture is using um, from a company called Atlabase. And so that means that your fixtures are always gonna line up between the two. Uh, when they first started putting this together, just as a little background, you know, they were using the Onyx fixture library and the capture. Sometimes you had to match them up, um, but now that's never gonna be a problem because they're using the exact same fixture library. So we're gonna press back here or close patch, which was down in the uh, lower right corner. You can see we've got everything patched here. And if we go to our 2D plan view, we see we've got three of them here. We've got page one, capture top, and capture front. And so that's right. If you zoom a little with uh, your scroll wheel or with a, a two-fingered pinch, what happened here is literally it brought in the patch from capture. Um, it, it imported it as best as it could. And so um, that is just, to me, is super cool in the sense that, you know, it gets you pretty close to something that's working, workable, if not completely usable. Um, but now we're going to dive in to some 2D plan stuff um, because this stuff is really helpful and it can do a lot of good for you. And, and there's more in 2D plan that meets the eye, I would say. Um, there's a lot in here. So as I noted, across the bottom here in 2D plan, we've got different pages. So I'm going to go back to page one because it's blank and we're going to start working inside the 2D plan here. So if I click this into edit mode uh, by clicking that live right there, goes to edit mode. Now I'm ready to start adding some lights. Now to add lights, all I've got to do is select them. So the easiest way to do that from a touch screen is I usually go group by group. 
So you can go individual fixtures on the fixtures tab, or we'll go to the auto tab here. And then I'm just gonna select uh, one group of fixtures. So I grabbed the, the fuse profile CMYs. Now they're selected in the console. I can go to 2D plan, add them. And here we get a variety of different add modes. So I'm gonna choose this second one. Now the difference between these is the first one, you're gonna be adding things individually. The second, they add in a line. The third is a freeform line. And so if you're following a background image or something like that, um, that can work to make a line of fixtures uh, that's on the floor maybe that isn't following a straight line. We've got the circle and then also the matrix mode uh, where you set the number of columns and then it's going to make a grid with a number of rows based upon the total number of fixtures in the columns. We're gonna go here and there is also mirror. So that will mirror left to right, but uh, we'll go here and place fixtures. Then it's always gonna tell us here at the top, the 2D plan always tells us what's, what to do. And so it's telling us to draw a line to place our items. I'm actually gonna pop myself quick in pan mode and just, um, I'm good, I'll put these right here. Then I'll go ahead, just, I can move these around if I want by dragging them. So I'm gonna drag them over here. And then in pan mode, I can, push with my finger now and find myself some clear space here in the 2D plan as well. Awesome. So now we've got our first fixtures in the 2D plan. I wanna go ahead now and add some other fixtures. So across the top here, you see we have fixtures, combined fixtures, zone fixtures, groups, and objects. So the difference between fixtures are combi and combined fixtures are when we're working with multi-part fixtures or fixtures that have multiple elements to them. Maybe it's an LED strip light with multiple cells. Uh, maybe it's a moving head that has multiple controllable pixels on the front, uh, something like that. Anytime you've got multiple of the same types of parameter within the same fixture, it's going to be a, um, it's going to be a multi-part. And so we can bring that in as a fixture, which will bring in the master uh, part of that fixture. But a lot of times, especially when we're working with the pixel mapping, we wanna see all of the individual cells. So to do that, we just select them under the combine fixtures tabs. So I'm gonna bring these in, press place combined fixtures. And then I can drag these out. Now, we see here as we're working with our 2D plan that these guys, uh, they came in uh, side to side and maybe for the sake of the 2D plan, I want to rotate them. So I've got my options tab open here, it was open by default, but you can press options here to find it. And in our options tab, uh, we can go ahead and we can just do the rotation on those. We can turn those guys. So maybe they're sitting straight up like this. We can also set the scale because these are huge right now. And we see here, we've got two types. We've got the, the four foot ones and the six foot ones. So they're in order here. And we can see here that they have their multiple cells here. And that's important if we are using the pixel mapping dialogs, which is uh, going to be a future webinar. So I've, I was in pan mode for moving my screen around. I'm gonna go to select mode because then I can select fixtures and I can move them around. Now say we're going in here, we wanna get everything lined up again. We'll bring these guys over here. And then we have a number of align tools available to us here at the top. So here we're able to align them all left, right, um, bottom or top. Then we're able to do a nice even spread left to right. Or if you're going uh, up to down, it'll be vertical. And you can even change the layout of the selected lights. So maybe they're in a mishmash or they're in a line like this. You wanna transform them into the circle. You wanna transform them into the grid. You can set the columns, you can set the spacing. You can go normal mode or snake. Um, and so normal mode would be, you know, it goes over one line and then it skips to the next like a typewriter. A snake goes back and forth, press apply, and that will then take. But the, the big key here is, um, when you're bringing in your fixture, if it is a multi-part fixture, if it's got multi-elements to it, 
then you're going to want to use the combined fixture in the 2D plane uh, for to be able to see all the cells and also for when you're using the pixel mapping. Okay. Now the pixel mapping uh, dialos does come through the zone fixtures here. And the first time you use it, you just have to hit enable dialos support. Um, we're, we're not going to cover dialos in today's webinar because there's a webinar um, which would be a week from today, actually, um, next Thursday, which is going to cover everything in dialos from the ground up. And you really don't want to miss that. I know I'm not going to. I'll, I'll be tuning in as well. Um, and because there's, there's a lot in it. It's not just a pixel mapper. So I definitely uh, encourage you guys to come and check that one. Now, we can also bring in our groups uh -huh, and we can also bring in static objects. And so what I'm gonna do here is pop out of here real quick and go ahead and create some groups. And then we'll go back and, um, and bring those into our 2D plan here. So creating groups, we went over this in the last webinar is really simple as selecting your lights. Um, there's multiple ways to do that. So I could select the auto group here. I could type on the command keypad. Um, etc. And then I'm just going to press record, press a group tile, or um, just so you're aware, we'll give these a name first. So that you're aware, you can go ahead and press clear once you do one group. And I could take 11 through 18. And I could say record group two. That's going to record it in group slot number two without even having to switch the window. Okay, which can be super helpful. And you see here, I'm still renaming the group, even though I'm not in that view. I'll show you that one more time. So I'm going to press clear. Then I'm just going to type 21 through 30. Okay, enter. Then record group three. Enter. Then I'm typing to name it and pressing enter. So I don't even have to be on the groups window. It's still renaming that. Now I can clear, grab, I'll go back to the auto groups, grab the darts. Go ahead, record that as a group. Try to spell it as wrong as I can. Go back here, clear again. I'm actually, instead of clearing, I'll show you that you can deselect um, just by hitting the group tile again. That's totally doable as well. Now I've got my seven baton, I've got my 42s and my 72s. And we can see here that they are separated into master and parts. And so that's when, that's when we're working with the multi-part fixtures um, that have those multi-elements to them, is we're going to have a master section and a part section. So the master section is, like it sounds, it's going to be anything that governs the whole fixture, right? So if you've got an LED moving light, um, say you've got one of those strip lights that tilts, um, then the tilt and maybe the intensity would be over the master, but then the parts would have the RGB values, right? Um, and that's how that works. So when you're grouping, you often want to keep those separate and, and work with those separately. And so I'm going to take just my master of my, my two types of seven battens, record those as group five. Go ahead and do the two part units. Record that as group six. Then I'm just typing again. I don't have to go to the group screen. I can still rename it there. And then we've got our house lights, the fuse pendants. And I'm going to just record that in the corner. So that'll be group 15 so that I keep my house lights separate from everybody else. Awesome. Very cool. Great. Cool. So now that we've got some groups, we can go ahead and work with them in our 2D plan. So I'm going to make my, my screen normal again, take down that uh, command area. Back to the 2D plan, hitting live again to pop into edit mode. And we're going to add some groups. The groups pop in here in a window, just like the combined fixtures. And so I can select, you know, all of them, some of them. Great thing with groups is just to throw them, say I want four columns, you know, and have it just organize the columns real quick for me. I can do that. And then I just go and I scroll with my scroll wheel or do a two-fingered zoom. 
drag this out however I'd like. That looks nice. Bring this in. Perfect. Now this is more of like a, a magic tape, magic sheet type 2D plan. And you can probably see that the 2D plan can be used for a lot of different things. Maybe you've used them on other consoles before um, where you know, you can do an overhead type view. You can do a front type view and those are useful, but also just laying out your fixtures and having quick, easy visual reference to them can be helpful many times as well too. So here within the 2D plan view, there are a few other things we can do, um, such as background images. A lot of people ask about background images. You wanna bring in a CAD file of uh, your show or something like that. We can do that with PNG type images. So the file type is a PNG. It's just a image file. It's very standard. And we're able to do that here. It's very popular. You just hit change. There are some samples in the sample folder here. We'll get rid of that one sometime. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna choose the, the spacey background here. You see here then it, it didn't come out over my fixtures. It's, it's centered on the whole 2D plan view, but there are controls for that. So we can change the scale, we can center, we can fill, we can tile. So I think I'm gonna center it and just bring the size down till it's covering my fixtures and then you have a background. Uh, background can be anything, it has transparency to it. So it can be as bold or as uh, background as, as you want. Uh, the best way to see it of course is to pop out of edit mode there as you see. When I do move out of edit mode, um, I'm able to see, okay, you know, that's what it actually looks like when I'm working um, instead of just edit mode with the 2D plan here. We also have layers in the 2D plan. So I mentioned pages, those are for different views, but then there are layers and layers are really helpful too. So say I go and create a new layer here. I could go lock my old layer and come onto my new layer here and then go over here and grab my darts, add those guys in. It always tells us, by the way, how many fixtures are selected, so we know. We'll put those guys up here. I'm gonna give ourselves a little bit of space to work. And so now those are on different layers and the benefits there are the ability to uh, show the beams, hide the beams, uh, lights on and off, turn off the, the images, um, turn off the text that's below them, select them all, deselect them all, um, and be able to do that within the 2D plan, as well as, of course, completely hide the layer as needed. Uh, more than anything, layers uh, help you organize. You can rename, copy, delete them, uh, sort them from lowest to highest, et cetera. So those are there, especially uh, when you do bigger files, when you've got a lot of lights in there, it makes sense to separate stuff out so that uh, you're, you're able to work more accurately. And sometimes you, you may hide one element or another, depending on what you're working on to be able to work with other things. So we're gonna hide the layers now and uh, pop real quick in out of edit mode. So now we see a couple things about our 2D plan. For one, it's showing us that our lights are selected. Um, any lights that are selected, like I just selected this group, are gonna be in green with the last light selected being in red. That gives you an idea of the selection order, which of course is very important when it comes to uh, running effects or applying presets, um, anything like that's going to always be done using the grouping tool is, is going to be done um, in order to, in that selection order. Not only that, but if we begin to apply some attributes like intensity, pan tilt, color, we're going to see that reflected in the 2D plan as well. Um, there is a little more here though that I, I do appreciate. And that is that we can change what's appearing under our lights here. Uh, what information we see about the lights on the label. So here in edit mode, we'll, we'll select some lights. Whoops, I was in pan there. We'll switch back over to select. And you can see here, we have a spot that says te text here. And text allows us to change from a number of options. And so depending on what kind of work you do, a lot of you guys do, I saw a lot of film and TV stuff, and you guys will really appreciate being able to see what percentage the light's at. 
or the fixture number in the percentage or the name and percentage. There's a lot of options here. Now you may notice, depending on what you're showing, especially like the name or the type of the fixture, that you may need to spread some things out more. Uh, sometimes the text is gonna overrun each other. And so you can completely go ahead, drag this out, use your align tools in your spread and you're good to go. But it's super helpful because those labels are going to show um, while you're programming. You're able to see, okay, what percentage are these lights here? So maybe you're a film and TV person. The DP says, what percentage is that light at? They point at it. You're probably looking at an overhead or a front view here in the 2D plan and you say, boom, it's at 85%. You know, and they say, bring it to 60, done. You know, it's nice and quick and easy. Um, and so that's, that's a tool that's, that's really helpful in there. You can scroll through these. There's a lot in here. Uh, pretty much every variation, including putting the number of the fixture or the push or the percentage, excuse me, um, on the actual fixture tile, which I quite like. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the, the point is that uh, you, the user, can, can choose what you want and to get exactly what you need. Um, and so, totally put the fixture number there, etc. Awesome. Very cool. As we're uh, here in 2D plan, I'm just kind of looking at my uh, my various questions here, my various outline. Are there any questions about the 2D plan real quick before we move on? I think we've covered most things, um, but it's always good to uh, just make sure that uh, we covered everything for your use, use cases here. I'm going to pop out of edit mode here back into live as well. Awesome. I'm not seeing a lot of chatter there. Um, Jim wants to turn his entire 2D plane 180 degrees. Yeah. So that's actually something I was going to mention here. I was noticing here. So I showed you how to rotate lights, right? To do the rotation and move the lights. That's relative. Um, but then there's absolute as well. No, actually, I don't think there's an easy way to flip the whole thing. Like we can flip them horizontal. We can flip them vertical. And that's the way that the beam moves. Um, but um, but I don't think we can flip the things like that. Awesome. Yeah, so that those those are really um, a lot of the things you can do in 2D plan view. There's, again, depending on your needs, you may do layouts differently, right? Um, but ultimately, the tools are there to create uh, what you need, be able to get access to the parameters you need very quickly. Uh, once you are in live mode, as you see, we see the output of the lights, we also can select just by dragging over it, either by touch screen or by mouse. We can also select by clicking, um, deselect by clicking again, et cetera. Very cool. Awesome. There's a few other questions that have come in, but those ones are, are all ones that are, are pretty e simple. Um, yes, no questions uh, for the guys. So I'm going to let them handle that as well. Awesome. Very cool. Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and build some presets because we wanna talk about cloning here, okay? So I'm just gonna go ahead with my spots here, the fuse profiles, and bring the intensity to full, build preset. I'm just gonna do full half. Ten percent, zero, awesome, clear that out. Also resize my window here since we do have the luxury of the visualizer file here. So we have that up as well. Excellent. And so now I'm going to go ahead and just check these because I wasn't watching. Yep, full half, 10, zero. Oh, my zero, I didn't quite get right. That's okay because I can just go take my lights, take them to zero. Cord, merge. I could have replaced as well. Now we're good to go. Then I want to go ahead and make some colors. So I'm going to select these same lights, bring them to full. Go to my colors here. 
Do a quick red. Do a quick green. Blue. Cyan. And yes, as discussed yesterday, if you put it in the wrong spot, you can hit move, hit the tile, hit where it goes, then you'll move it. Magenta. Yellow. We'll just do a uh, amber. White or violet, I like to do violet. White. Excellent. So now we got some colors. Now we'll go ahead to pan tilt. And you've, you've noticed, if you weren't on the webinar yesterday, you will notice that uh, when I record uh, different presets in my presets down here, in Onyx, by default, it's going to filter by the type. So we've got the different parameter groups here on the bottom. It does filter by the type by default. You can override that. So in the record pop up here, if I wanted to store multiple types of parameters, I can select those. But if not, I just leave it as is. It's only going to store the parameter types that are in this particular preset window. Okay, so there isn't an all uh, window. Uh, that's one that, that comes up a lot, but you can make one. Uh, like if you don't have any framing units or you don't have a lot in framing or beam effects, a lot of people will use that. So now we go ahead, do some pan tilt stuff. So I'm just going to grab these lights. And in Capture now, I can actually right click in the Capture Visualizer. And with the CITP integration, I can actually aim the lights, which is really stinking cool. Um, that, that, that part's cool. I know, you know, it's been in the past in other visualizers, but it's, it's just really cool that that's here and we're able to use it. So I'm going to hit record on my console here. Record that there. So we'll just call that Downstage Center. And then maybe I hit uh, my next key. And whoops. Pull my command keypad again. Next. That's funky. I wonder why it wasn't next hitting next with the uh, capture up. So instead of the group, I'm just going to go to, I believe it's fixture one. So I'll type one, enter, and highlight. I'm going to turn on highlight as well. And now I have control of just that one. So maybe we'll make a band focus on these guys. Yeah, there my next is going great. So it's great that you can do this in a visualizer. Get it close to accurate for the real world, if not accurate. Great thing about presets, of course. You can always update them on site, but getting them close in the visualizer is just going to save you time. So now we see, even though I, I moved them in capture, they're still in here. Um, they're still in here in the programmer. And so even though I, I touched them in capture, I saw them, I could even select them in capture. Um, and they're brought into the programmer. So now they're, they're ready to record. Actually, I should mention that really everything you do in Capture is fed back into the programmer. So you can frame a picture, color it, pick a gobo, or just like anything you can control in Capture that's related to a DMX channel goes back into Onyx. So it's completely bi-directional. Yep, and we're gonna demo that here real quick for you as well. Really? really quite powerful especially framing you know being able to do this like visually really works well as you can see i've done that in capture now we've got that here 
Awesome. Very cool. So you can see that that's been brought in. And so it's, it's, it's absolutely nuts just to think about the integration between the two pre-programming, even using Capture Live and having it on your laptop next to a console um, and being able to select things and work really quickly and see the visual results program them in. Um, it's, it's just nuts um, how cool that is. So maybe I go ahead and now I'll just make a couple more quick presets here. Maybe I go out here in the house and then they're all in the center right now, but then I just go here to pan tilt over here and then fanning and I'm gonna fan them. I'm gonna pan until I get a nice fanned look. Yeah, they're just fanned across the room now. Just accidentally clicked off of them, but that's okay because I can press undo there to undo my programmer. That should undo. Oops, that's okay. I'll bring it back real quick. Pan tilt fan. Make that nice fan to look. Record that guy to a preset. Cool. So now I've got uh, two pan or three pan tilt presets of some colors, some intensity. Go in here, do a couple gobo presets as well. Awesome. And so just go to gobo, pick a nice David, gobo. before you dive too much into this, maybe you should explain the whole parameter control a little bit more on the fanning. Just sort of recap that quickly because people that weren't maybe in this before uh, may not know how to do the fan that you just did so nonchalant <laughs> very quickly there. Absolutely. Let's do that. Thank you. Yeah, you not know, a problem. Parameter controls, how to call up, you know, navigate that uh, and fanning would be probably a good one to show. Absolutely. So as Matthias noted, uh, you know, we're going to go do the short recap here. Yesterday, we spent a lot of time in this and so, or two days ago. So I do recommend that like going through that once we get that recording up. But when it comes to working with parameters in Onyx, um, we're first going to select lights, okay? And so we select them via groups. We can select them in the fixtures tab. We can select them in capture, right? Um, we also can select them with the keypad. Um, of course, we're popping this one up on the screen so you can see it. But on the console next to me, I can totally type as well. And it's the same keypad. Then when we get to controlling parameters, we use this arrow here to pop up our parameter controls. These four belts right here are either the belts or the wheels on your physical consoles. So the four encoder wheels on the consoles, the encoder belts on the uh, NX Touch or the M6 uh, match up exactly with what you see on the screen here. And we have parameter groups here. So we have on the left side, intensity, pan, tilt, color, gobo, beam, beam effects, framing. Now you're only gonna see here what applies to the lights you have selected, okay? And so if I select a different light, for example, like this Fuse SFX, there's no framing. It doesn't have framing shutters, so it's not gonna show up. The same like the seven buttons here, they're not a moving light. They don't have pan or tilt, so we don't get that here. We only see what we're gonna have. Um, these are also, not only are they on the screen here, but they're also on the small touch screens on the consoles. Um, so the consoles, the NX Wing, and the NX2 and the NX4 all have the small touch screen on the surface where you can touch to switch between these. And so first on the left, as mentioned, we have the regular parameters. These are the parameters. These are the things that lights actually do, right? So under intensity, we've got, you know, the output, the intensity output, the shutter slash strobe channel. Pan tilt is going to be pan and tilt, of course. Color is going to be your RGB, your CMY. Gobos for gobo wheels. Beam for things like zoom, focus, iris, frost. Beam effects, and then framing for framing shutters. Now you'll also see we've got these, these dots here. And the dots indicate us that there are multiple pages of four encoders. So we press on it again, we get to the second page and on and on, like in framing, there are three, okay? So if you need to get to the extras, they're there. Um, we also have the ability to modify these parameters. And so that's the right side. And that's what Matthias was saying I nonchalantly did, which is true. Um, and so we start with a parameter here and whatever parameter we touched last, like I'll just go touch tilt 
on my on my encoder wheel on my console. And so now that gets selected with the white box around it. Now, if I go over here to effects or effects timing or fanning or grouping or rate, um, well, not rate, but either of the first four, I'm applying whatever I'm doing in fanning to the last parameter that I touched on the parameter wheels or, or the last parameter group that I viewed. So if I go to color, blue selected, then I go back to fanning. Now it says I'm fanning on blue. Here it says I'm fanning on tilt. So say we highlight these guys and we go ahead, we could start by having tilt here. And then we go to fan and there are a variety of fan options here. So you can see here, it, it fans the lights on the tilt where they follow this curve where the ones on the, the first selected lights move the most, the last selected or the middle moves less. The last selected moves in the other direction. But there are also a number of fanning options. It's not just a key in a wheel, right? Um, so we can mirror or separate our fanning. So that allows us to fan, uh, to move this in separate ways and not have it always be mirrored. We can set it from two point uh, to three points. So if I do like a three point mirror here, or maybe I like to do a three point separate actually, then I can take the center and send the center far from where its base is with the fanning or keep it close and uh, send the sides far off from where their base point is and get different fans across my fixtures. Now, of course, this with pan and tilt right here, it, it's very easy to see is very vibrant, but this is also gonna work with any other parameter. It's gonna work with color, with beam, with gobos, whatever. Uh, there's also the curve versus linear. So you can see I can toggle that there. That's just, again, you know, visually we can see it's the distribution. It's how they distribute the amount of change to each parameter among this shape that we're fanning. Um, and so you, you can see a difference there. And then you can, you can zero it back out as well. Now this has this nice graphical interface, which we can tap twice on it on our uh, console. No, we can't, that doesn't do that. Yeah, you tap it twice on the top on the console and it pops up a view. Um, or you can use your actual encoder wheels. So you can move your, uh, your scroll wheel down here if you're on the PC. And then on the console, I can move the physical encoder wheels in order to move these. I can watch it, do what it's doing, um, et cetera. And so that's totally doable as well. There's a lot of ways to use the fanning there. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about fanning later, but that's, that's the basics of, of getting to that. So where were we? We were gonna make some, uh, we were just gonna make some gobos real quick. I'll take my lights here, pop them to full, make a couple nice gobo presets. I'm not even gonna rename them because gobo one and gobo two are great gobo names. That'll work. And so now we've got some preset made, presets made. And so now I wanna go into cloning um, because cloning is a really big help when we're creating show files. You can use it, um, you know, the, the, um, the way that a lot of people think about cloning is, okay, you've got a show, you're touring with it. You've got, you know, the 20 or 30 or 50 lights that you've got, and then you're coming into a venue and they've got 20, 30, 50 lights that you wanna integrate into your show. So how do you copy what you're doing to a new fixture. Well, the easiest way through the patch is, is cloning. Um, so we can do that in the Onyx menu and in the patch. And then I'm just gonna go patch some new fixtures. So I'm gonna go commands, new fixture. Uh, for those who weren't here yesterday, we'll run through it real quick. We get our fixture library here. So then I'll just go to elation, DE, and then scroll down. And then I'm gonna patch something that's not in the show. So just as an example here, we'll find some sort of moving light that's not like ancient. Let's see. Oh, we used to do the, um, oh, my mind's blanking, that's okay. What's it called? Oh, it's the Artiste series. Yeah, that's how they start. That's how their name starts. So we have the Da Vinci's good, good spot unit. Pop it in the mode. So this is the venues lights. Maybe there's 10 of them. So I'm gonna press the amount to, to 10. I'm gonna call this venue spot fixtures, venue spots. 
set my start ID to uh, 1001. I usually put venue stuff at. Press apply. Let it patch away. And then we're good. So we got those guys patched. They patched somewhere. Um, they're not going to be in capture, but we're going to have them in our show be able to control them. So those guys are patched. They're on their own universe. They're just in they're just enjoying their life there. And so now we can back out of here, or rather, sorry, go into patch here, and we can clone. So there's a cloning tab in patch, which we're about to use, but we actually start here on the patch screen first. And so the first step of cloning is deciding which fixture you have that you want to copy the information to the new fixtures of, okay? So for this example, there are 10 of these venue spots and there just so happens that there are 10 of these, these fuse profiles, one through 10. So I can go commands, clone fixture, and it shows me the syntax here is copy, ID, add ID. So then we're gonna go copy and we go um, one through 10 at, and then we find our fixture number is 1001 through 1010, enter. And now here's what it does, this is great. This walks us through over here exactly what's going to happen. Okay, and you'll notice if you've used it before, they, they updated this GUI a little bit, which is great. But um, it shows us here that, cutting off a little, that's funky. I think these top bits for some reason are cutting off over that window. Um, they were in a beta version, but it's almost ready. And so what it shows us here is the source is units one through 10. The target is 1001 through 10, 1010. And then the options, uh, Q, presets, and groups. And then it's gonna show us how they each line up here as well. So you can preview before you hit clone, you can preview, did I do it right? Did I not, right? Did I line everything up, all of my fixtures with the venues fixtures as I desire, or did I not? If you didn't, you can remove your selected command, you can remove all commands. You can do multiple commands in here at once. So I did copy fixture one through 10 and 1001 through 1010, and I could bring that in here and then I could uh, load up another command, load up another, load up another. Um, I don't think there's really a limit, but I've never done more than, you know, four or five at a time. Um, and then the queues, presets, and groups um, might seem self-explanatory. It's just going to say, okay, you know, where this light is in queues, does it copy the new fixture into those queues? Sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes you might just want it to do presets and groups, right? Because then you can program some stuff with, with the venue rig, uh, run it slightly separate from your stuff, et cetera. Maybe you, you just copy it in the queues. That's generally the quickest way. And then you just build yourself an inhibitive fader so that you can bring the venue lights on and off as needed. And then they move around and change color and stuff to match your lights. Okay. Uh, the, the really big key here with cloning and getting ready to clone is that um, you have things built into presets. It's a really big deal because the console is going to go ahead and put these new lights in all the presets that the fuse profiles are in. But even though they're, they're both gray lights, they're both even from the same manufacturer, um, you know, they're not going to uh, match perfectly. The colors aren't going to be the same because they're different lights. And so you're going to, we're going to be able to go, you know, update those colors, update those positions, etc. So execute commands right here. That's going to make the cloning happen. And then if we back out of here, we're going to see that if we go to our auto groups here, to our Artis Da Vinci's, they are now selected and they're in our intensity, they're in our pan tilt, they're in our color. Okay, anything that matches up, they're going to be in there and we're able to go ahead. So maybe we take them to full. They're not in, in capture, but if they were, we'd see them and take them to cyan. And they are as such, they're, they're brought to full, they're brought to cyan. If we switch from preset name here to uh, value, we see that it brings up a color that probably looks very cyan because they're a CMY mixing uh, unit and that's just gonna bring cyan to full and we've got that there. Uh, Multi-part fixtures. So we can also clone multi-part fixtures. It just takes another step. So go to our patch here and this time I'm gonna patch a, uh, let's just go, actually a good way to do this is to grab um, just our first seven batten. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna clear. 
I'm going to grab our first seven batten master. Build a full preset for it. So when I'm copying into an existing preset, I'm going to merge when this comes up. The other way around this, uh, that if you're going to do a lot of merging at once, then just go ahead. Let's take it to 50. Click merge right here on conflict. That's going to make the merge the assumption. Hit the star. That's going to save it. Boom. So now I didn't have to navigate that pop-up. I was just able to move, able to speed the process up a lot. Boom, 10%, zero. And as we see, the merge is, is assumed whenever there's a conflict, whenever there's something already where we're programming, merge is being assumed. We're just going to turn that off just because um, I don't want to confuse any of you if you didn't do that. But that's one way to definitely speed things up. Then uh, color is just those overall macros. We're not going to touch those here. Same with beam effects. So now that we did that, we can grab group one through six, build some color presets. So, whoops, red. Green. Blue. And I'm just gonna turn my merge on. See cyan is uh, blue green, yep. Magenta, yellow. I'm just going to use RGB to be quicker. If I actually had these in front of me, we'd make some prettier colors. Amber and violet. RGB white, boom, merged all those in. So now we've got all those presets going. And so now we can clone a multi-part where we've got these groups that we're that are separate from our master. And so I just made presets for just one of these units. Um, and this is really helpful actually. So you get on, I, I do a lot of corporate shows and uh, you get on there and you know, they, they tell you, oh, we told you you had 10 of these that you might have pre-programmed to, but really you have 15, right? That comes up. So we'll copy fixture of what were my numbers. It was, use this guy here. It's a great way to go through there. So when we're dealing with a multi-part fixture in Onyx, uh, what we've got here is we've got the whole number, like 61 is the master. And then 61.1 through however many segments it has are the, the parts, um, the subs, you know, the, the smaller fixtures. Okay. And so what I can do is uh, I'm going to do copy fixture 61 at 62 through, and then uh, what is it through? 70. Enter. So that's going to pop up here in cloning. Now note here, it's, it shows us, okay, here, you know, we're good to go. It has gone ahead and it is copying all the parts because I did make a typo, which is helpful here to show just removing the commands. So I need to do 61.0. Yes. Um, but this time we'll actually type copy 61.0 through 70.0. That's telling it only pay attention to the .0. And oops, I totally just typed that wrong. So 61.0 at 62.0 through 70.0. Enter. That should be the correct command now. Yep. Nope, it's not. I thought you could do it that way, but maybe it's not happy with that. And that's okay. Um, in which case we can go slower way, just remove this and I can just go copy 61.0 at 62.0, enter, etc. So the difference between the master and the parts um, is that 
the master is the parameters that cover over the whole fixture. So this is a strip light, an LED strip light, for example, and it has um, like the, the small ones have six segments and the bigger ones have 10 segments. And so the master is the intensity, it's color macros, strobe, anything that governs the whole fixture. Then the parts are those individual cells that you can control. So for the cells, it's just the colors, which for these is, uh, you know, the red, green, blue, white, amber. I think there was a lime in there as well. Okay. And so when we're cloning a master to uh, a multi-part fixture, we just have to do them separate. So as an example here, I did 61 to 62. That's going to do the master. And then I would do 61.1. .1. So copy 61.1. Uh, at six one or six two dot one. Oops, at six two dot one through um, six or seventy dot ten. And yeah, the ten ten segment, and it'll all show up in cloning here. Now, there's a good thing to note here is when this does line things up. Uh, one of the things with cloning, whether you're doing multi-part or single, is what does the console do when you have, say, two of one fixture cloning as the source to 10 of another fixture, um, single or multi-part, right? Um, and what the console does then is it just repeats. So, and I, I do this a lot, actually. I have this set up in my template file that I use personally when I set up shows, is I have two fixtures for a lot of color mix things, a lot of color effects and, and color presets and color cues that I've built up. And so I just take those two fixtures and whether I'm cloning that to two, five, six, eight, 12, 200, it doesn't matter. What it does is it just clones them every other. So it looks at the source and it just says, okay, you know, here I'm copying to the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and it just alternates with what it has. You could do two sources, three, it doesn't matter. It just you know, goes to the end and then starts repeating it. So you don't have to worry about, oh, well, if I'm doing five fixtures to, you know, seven, what happens to the last two? Well, it just repeats fixture one and two unless you tell it to do something else. So you can go ahead there and you can clone those guys, let those guys go through and boom, and they are done. Um, so a lot of good stuff in there. And really cloning is a great way. I know there's been a couple questions about it. It's a great way to be able to uh, to make some stuff or use some stuff from a, a former show file that you used or pre-program some stuff on a couple fixtures, pre-program a bunch of presets, cues, whatnot, and then uh, patch in your entire rig, clone things to it, and be up and running really fast. Um, it's a good way to save time, good way to make yourself more efficient. Awesome. So now we're going to see that our various seven battens, yep, they're all in our color presets there um, because we have cloned them. And so that is, is cloning, um, including multi-part. The big key there is that you do have to clone the parts different from the whole uh, to make sure you get that maximum level of control. Awesome. Any questions on cloning real quick uh, while we're still here in cloning? And, and then we're going to move to the next part and um, be able to do that. Awesome. I'm not seeing anything uh, super pertinent come in. So now we're going to talk about the windows and the views in Onyx. And there's so much good stuff in here um, with the way that you can, you can work with this. And so we're going to spend a bit of time in here just discovering all of the different things that, that you can do. Because ultimately, the vision of Onyx and the vision of all the different views and F keys and things like that is that you're able to get the views and the control that you desire for whatever type of shows you do and be able to lay out the console completely the way that you want to. Um, views, as we can see, are all on this left sidebar. So we have various views here that are predefined, but you can build your own as well too. And that's what we're gonna do here. And so um, by default in Onyx, we basically have a few terms here in views. So we have a view, and within that view are windows. So a view is what we're pressing here on a 
on a key, on a sidebar key. And within those views, then there are individual windows. Now, sometimes like here, the programmer, it's full screen, right? When we click on the view. And so the window is full screen in the view. But other times, like this fixture presets, our window's broken up into two halves. So let me run a demonstration to show you some different things you can do within views. So I'm going to go to the presets, just this uh, four quad presets here. I'm going to right click on it, unlock and edit. Or if we are on a console, I'm going to hold my edit key hit and hit the button with my, uh, with my finger. Unlock and edit. And now I've got this toolbar up here. I see my little unlock icon here. Now I know I'm ready to work with window configurations. So I can choose, first of all, the amount of frames that I want here. There's a lot of options here, but we're not stuck to just these. OK, so well, these are almost all of the combinations you can do. Um, you can also modify these separately. I'm going to show you how. So say I choose two columns. I could then go ahead and maybe I delete the left column or the right, right column. Do I know my left from right? Yes, I do. Then I have these dividing lines here. So I can either delete this space, which would make this guy full screen, or I can split this again. So maybe I split it this way, and then I split it this way. It's also worth noting, it's very important to know that, that the views, no matter what size screen or console you're on, they're always going to scale, OK? And they scale really nicely. Um, sometimes, I'll show you in a minute, if the window gets too small, it's going to tell you about it and help you to resize it um, just because it literally can't fit the data you know, for the window in, in that space. Then maybe I go, I use this arrows, and I'm able to drag different sizes here, OK? Maybe I cut this window out entirely. So now I've just kind of got a template here, right? This is, this is a blank blueprint. Now I can use the plus arrows to start to bring in different windows. There are a lot of windows in here that can, that can make up your views. And depending on what you do, you may use some more than others, OK? I'm just going to go here, and let's do the uh, fixtures here. Then I'm going to go up here and do my presets right here. You know what? I'm actually going to delete that. I'll do the preset strips like there is in this one demo view below here. So I'm going to go add some more of these. So now I can go in here to presets, intensity, pan tilt, color, gobo, beam, beam effects. You know, say I just do that many across here. And then maybe on the bottom here, I go ahead and I could do a programmer um, and kind of make this my go-to programming look like when I'm looking at my rig. So then when I'm ready to save, all I do is hit the save key here. I name my preset here, choose the monitor to save. So if you have multiple monitors here, um, you're able to, to save view assignments um, across multiple monitors. Um, or just for a single monitor. So sometimes you want to press a view, right? You want all your monitors to change. Other times you just want one of them to change. And you can select and deselect here which monitors um, are working. In a few minutes, we'll go over displays and, and how to do that. Okay. And so you give it a name here. You know, this is not really a creative name. You can also hit all here on the monitors. And now it's saved. You also can go ahead, if you uh, modified things, let's just modify something here. You see here, once we modified it, we have options when it comes to saving. So even if I go here and lock my workspaces, I still have this asterisk here and it's on this view, which tells me, OK, I've modified this view. Either the asterisk means if it's white that I've just scrolled within that view, or if it's uh, orange and flashing like this as long with the star, it means that I need to unlock and edit and save that view if I want to keep my changes. If I scrolled or made changes in here and I don't want to keep them, I can just double tap on that view and it comes right back to whatever was last saved. So you have that. Um, do you want to get rid of the sidebar? Yes, you can do that. You can absolutely do that. So that's going to be in the preferences. I'll show you that here because it does very much apply to what we're doing here. 
and it is here in uh do to do, do, do it is in the view the displays down here system displays and then we have sidebar we have the encoder sidebar that's the one on the right here so the task sidebar is the left one the encoder sidebar is the right one especially if you're working on a smaller external screen or something or a little laptop the playback visualizer below so you can if you turn all three of those off and apply it you get this okay you get the full screen of, of buttons you just can't from this view switch views and such so we'll turn those back on uh, while we are here let's talk about displays while we're here so you can have multiple displays on various consoles or um, on the pc and so to turn those on, it's going to walk you through. They're all named here. So it's internal left and right if you were on an M6. Um, and then you have your external displays. And whenever you need a display to, to show up, you just turn it on here and enable your virtual display, press apply. And then if you're in the PC like this, it just pops up, OK? Um, it should be enabled on a console. If you're in a console, you plug in a display that should show up enabled there, OK? And you can't close this window. You can't get rid of it unless you go in here to displays and turn it off. That's on purpose um, because it treats it as a permanent display. Um, and so in that regard, you can turn on and off displays having, as you can see here, up to eight, which is uh, quite a lot. And uh, but hey, you know, if you're you're doing something uh, that's especially if your rig's permanently installed, have eight displays, man. I would I would enjoy that. Um, we also have here the ability to turn off the various indicators um, that are in the toolbar. You can customize this completely to your needs. But of course, there's always the restore button to take us to defaults. And so if you turn something off that you didn't mean to, you're like, how did I turn that thing off? I don't even know what it's called. And just hit the restore key and life will be good again. In here as well, there's the brightness. Uh, you'll see more info in this if you have hardware connected um, and be able to control the brightness of you know, like the backgrounds of the integrated display of the LEDs on the touches, um, as well as calibrate your uh, your little display there, if you have one. Um, but back to where we were over here, since we talked about displays there. Um, so I customized one window here, very simply, br brought in some different things, but let's do a little bit more. So I mentioned that there are some windows that you can bring in, for example, we can go ahead and bring in, do, 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 do. let's find a good one here. It's like the grouping tools. Go here to fixture grouping tools. And it's going to tell me here, okay, where you've placed it is not big enough. And so you just click there and it's going to resize whatever's around it in order to make that fit to its minimum size. Okay. And you may see if you switch between different devices and maybe you get on a laptop that's got a small screen, you might run into this where, um, you know, where you see this pop up a lot and you may have to get rid of some of your windows, you know, some of your views, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, that's all good as well. So you can, you can move those things around, change them for smaller windows, whatever you need to do. But it's always going to tell you if you don't have enough space, that's not going to be a problem at all um, to be able to do that. Um, that covers the sizing of windows. Um, then let's talk about I'm actually gonna not save this. Then let's talk about actually assigning things to the sidebar. This is this is a whole um, a whole thing because there's a lot in here. So we can go in here, we can right click. And sure, we just moved around all of our views. We just moved around these different windows, made our own custom view and saved it. But we can also switch between existing views that we've made or the ones that are built in or just windows without going through all that. So as an example, We'll just go here to edit function. And now we have an option of many, many different functions that we can use on the sidebar. We can, we can blank it out, remove the current function. We can add a new empty screen. We can choose an existing screen. So that's just gonna take us to views here. And then these are all the views that are either that come built in or you've recorded and named. Okay, they're all right here. Then we've got windows. Windows has some cool stuff in here because you can choose any window that's in the console here, like 2D plan here, okay? Um, like selected fixtures. But 
it gets even better because for some of these windows, for ones that aren't like huge, you can select them as a pop up or a pop out, okay? Um, as I like to call it, as it pops sideways, okay? It pops up from here. And when you do that, if I go back out of this, I now see that I actually get the group window to pop out. And so this is really great for things like groups, uh, the fixtures, and there's a lot of different windows that you can use as pop-ups. And this is great when you're in here, you're programming, you don't want to lose your focus on your window. Maybe you've got your programmer up, but you just want to grab something quick. You just hit this pop-up, you know, press what you need, press out of it, you're done. You don't have to switch the views again. It just pops up partially. You don't lose your whole view. Um, many windows can be, can be brought into that. Let's go back to edit function. So we have windows here and there's a whole um, bunch of windows here. So much good stuff in here, um, just to highlight a few of my favorites. Um, obviously we've been through the fixture center fixtures and groups. We've been working in those windows from time to time here. Um, but uh, there also are some windows here like the park and highlight window. Um, there's the live output, which shows you the output of what's coming out of the console right now. You've got individual preset windows as we went over, um, selected queue list, status of your, your different playback types, your beat editor, if you like to use chases and the beat button a lot, the dialos buttons. You can view your patch, which can be helpful. Maybe you just want to look at the patch, like you've got a, a, an L2 on the gig, and they just want to check something in the patch real quick. Um, and, you know, you say, okay, but you just give them the patch list. That is a one that's not editable, which is great um, to have, because as you know, if uh, you may know that if you go in your patch and you just leave it open and then people walk by or they're checking something, they may kind of move the address around on something. And that's not uh, what you want a lot of the time. And there's also RDM there, different panels that we can come up with, um, including the uh, image view. Sometimes people like to put their logo in there. It looks cool. You can get a whole function keys panel. And uh, the system stuff is cool as well. Just if you're on a PC, the hardware monitor, um, it can be helpful to see how hard you're pushing your PC. Keep an eye on that. Uh, you can keep the clock. You can make a whole window of clocks. As I know that's popular. Um, and view the manual directly from a window. With all of these, as I mentioned, when you press on them, you can dedicate them as a pop-up. You can also dedicate them to a, a given display. Okay, so you can say, okay, when I press this button, I want this to, to show up, but only on bottom right display four. And that name, that is customizable in the displays tab where we were um, a couple minutes ago. And so that is that is super cool as well. There's there's just, there's a lot in here to get into, but then we've only touched views and windows, right? And when we're talking about sidebar assignments here, we've also got commands, fixtures, groups, presets, and banks, okay? Not only that, but we have the different places we can assign things here under assignments. So let's first look at the different things we can, we can do under commands. So commands allows us to uh, do different console commands on our sidebar button. This can help a lot on a PC, but also on a console. Um, so things like the actions category here in commands, a lot of these are already, you know, in the, on the console keypad, but there are things like a double clear to fully clear your programmer. So you don't have to clear twice. You can put that on a button. Um, you can go ahead and put undo on a button, um, even though it already is. But if you're on a PC again, you know, a double load, which we're going to go over here. Uh, things like uh, update, update, you know, lamping on fixtures, uh, all these things you can put on buttons if desired. We can also select different faders. We can have a beat button, which is great. Um, if you want to tap the beat and you're not using an NX touch, you can put that on a function key on a, on a screen sidebar. We can select our different parameter groups. These are personal favorites of mine because I, I really like having a hard key. I know the little touch screen is great, um, but I do like having hard keys to get to my parameter groups. That's just a personal thing, but maybe you like that as well. Um, as we discussed in the webinar the other day, um, that, that does show what console I learned on first because it had hard keys. Uh, channel resolutions. So when you're in here and you're moving these encoder wheels, uh, whether you're doing it on the screen with your mouse like I am here, 
whether you're doing it with your encoder wheel like I am now, or uh, like on an NX Touch with the belts. Sometimes you might find that it moves too fast or too slow for your liking. Right here on this cog, we have a resolution setting. It can be dynamic, that's the default, where based on how quickly you move, it's gonna guess how fine of control you want. Now you move slower, you know, it gives you more fine control, you move fast, it gives you a coarser, quicker moving control, right? Um, but ultimately, if dynamics not working out for something particular, you know, you're, you're getting real close in with framing shutters or some, or, you know, touching up pan and tilt from 300 feet away, um, and you just need to be in the finest control possible, then you can change these right here, but also you can go ahead and you can get to those in the functions, in the channel resolutions. So you can have one for 16-bit. I like to do 16-bit and dynamic because then I'm in dynamic most of the time, but then I set up another one and I just go here to commands and go to 16-bit. And now I've got those choices, right? So that when I've got that time, when I'm in here and I'm, you know, trying to adjust that framing shutter that's shooting 75 feet and, and I'm trying to frame it up real tight on something, or I'm touching a pan until, you know, 300 feet away and I need that really fine control, I kick it into fine, then I know I don't have to, you know, be so tight with my movements. I, I, I can move it freely and get exactly what I want. Um, Channel visualization, you can pop up this, this channel visualization where we were a minute ago, change a lot of the info on there. A live time, this is the time that things move into the programmer. We did go over that yesterday or two days ago, um, but it's a great one. I use it all the time to be able to have things come in instantly or have a nice fade to them all the way to a very slow sneak, like 60 seconds, you know, where you're bringing something in during a show that you forgot it was supposed to be on, but you don't want anybody to notice uh, that you're bringing it in. And you can do that over 60 seconds, make it come in nice and slow. And so nobody notices. Uh, you could start, pause, reset your time code, switch your workspaces, uh, turn the sidebar on and off. Well, I guess turn the sidebar off if you put on the sidebar. And then you can have a save button, menu button, various things like that. Okay. Fixtures, groups, presets, and banks are pretty self-explanatory in here where you can put on a sidebar button, on a function key, wherever you want. You can put specific lights, specific groups, specific presets, as well as banks, which are our, our pages of faders here in Onyx, our banks of faders. Okay. So you can do that. You're able to put any of these on a button. If you want to access them a lot, you can put them on the side of the screen. As noted, the assignments here, this was, we were just putting things on the sidebar, but it's the same deal here with the function keys. So that's the F keys that are going to be on um, a lot of the hardware. The NX Touch has them. The Wing, the NX2, the NX4 all have function keys. Um, then the Playback 2 module and the T-bar, that's in the M6 console if you have one of those. Um, all of them assign exactly the same way. They all have exactly the same options, so you really can't lose. Awesome there. Let me look at my notes here, see if we covered everything. I think we did cover everything on Windows. Um, the one thing I didn't cover was the uh, maximize here. So if you're in here and you're on a view that's got a bunch of things, and, oh, and we got to do workspaces. That's what's on my notes, workspaces. And you want to take one of these and make it bigger, you can just hit this guy right here, and then you get two options. This keeps the sidebars, that's the first one. This one maximizes and takes over the sidebars. You're able to do what you need to do, you know, within that window, hit the blinky blue shaded button again, and then you're back to where you were. So this is super helpful uh, to be able to do this as well. I'm just going to save my workspace here, save my view, and now we'll talk about workspaces. Let me grab a quick sip of tea. So we already talked about, we've got views here. There's one through however big your screen is. I've got 15 here. You may have less or more. Um, and then we can scroll down. We can get more, right? There's a lot of them. Um, are there 100? Who knows? There's a lot of them. I've actually never scrolled to the bottom. I don't want to know. Um, there's a lot of them. And, but we also have workspaces. So workspaces are actually different sets of views. 
where we can go ahead and for different users, for different functions like programming versus playback, um, we're able to have different workspaces. And so the workspace is gonna contain all the views um, and be able to um, switch between different sets of views, okay? So once again, I unlocked the workspace. Um, it was unlocked because when I, when I edit a view, like if I, my workspaces were locked and I right click unlock and edit here, that unlocks my workspaces. They, they unlock with the views. Um, and, um, and then you're able to, to manage your workspaces here. So by default, you've got Compose, Playback, DJ, and Examples. These are ones that the team's made and they work well. I like to start with them. You can do what you want, right? You can start blank. Um, so if we go to managed workspaces here, we then get these keys along the bottom where we can rename, delete, color, copy, or, uh, or tools. And so maybe I go in here and I just add a new one, right? And I call this David, press enter. And now I've got a blank workspace. I'm still in my view from my other workspace. So that's showing up, um, but I'm in this new workspace. Now I've got my sidebar. I can start choosing, choosing different views, right? Choose some commands here. You know, maybe I go in here and I choose a window. I do my, uh, my clock and I have pop up. And I get things how I like here. And then again, with these managed workspaces, I can rename it. I can delete it. I can copy it. I can color it, which is always nice. Give it a nice color. You can actually save your colors down here in the bottom if, if you want to get into that. We are lighting guys. So we like to click on here and then select our color, make it pretty because we like colors. It's one of the most powerful things we have in lighting. And then there's also tools, which just brings you here um, into the, the settings menu, which is actually, it's really helpful because you can say, you can go in here, you can save your workspaces and layouts to a file. And then you bring those along to another show file, to even another venue, an existing show file, a new show file you're creating, uh, whatever you want to do. You can save yours here. You can reset the defaults too. Um, that can be helpful if, you know, you, you were playing around, you were like, hey, I got inspired after that webinar to try some new things. And then you're like, you know, maybe I'll just stick with what I had. Um, you, can, you can go back to factory default. That's no problem at all. Uh, if you did save your loading, that's replace workspace layouts here at the top. You hit it, file browser comes up um, on Windows. If you're on the console, you get the full screen file browser. You go find it on your USB drive or wherever you have it. Open that guy up. It's now saved into the show file and uh, you're good to go. As you can see the coloring there, it's gonna color the top here as well as color the icon. So you can see um, exactly what you've got there, follow the color um, and they're great. The last thing here in the workspace is uh, lock when you're done changing things, just to keep things locked so you don't accidentally change things while you're programming is launch views. So launch views is just when you need that other window or view occasionally, Everything's in here. All the views are in here as well as all the individual windows. And I just clicked off of it. You may do that on accident too from time to time. And you can select any of those and it's gonna give it to you full screen. And then when you wanna go back, you just click on the, the key, sidebar key, F key, whatever to go back and you're good to go. Uh, the, the point here is basically there's a lot of options and we've, we've dove pretty deep into them here. Um, play around with them, experiment. Set things up the way that you enjoy and so that you can see the things that you want to see during your show. Um, ultimately, experimenting is, is probably the best way to figure out what's going to work best for you. And, um, and it, it can be a lot of fun to really find that out and, and move things on the fly. Let's see a couple. Uh, okay, so somebody asked in there about uh, settings file. So we answered that. Um, can I create users in different settings? I can't. Okay, so yeah, those the questions in there um, should be pretty answerable. Um, can I demonstrate loading a set of workspaces? Well, sure. Just for kicks here. Um, all we have to do in here again, just I, we went over this a minute ago, is go to workspaces. You hit replace here. You bring in your file that you saved. Maybe you put it on a USB drive and you brought it over, and you're good to go. You hit open. It's gonna it's gonna overwrite what you've got. So that's that's an overwrite. That's a replacing everything in there, and you're good to go. Awesome. 
Very cool. I think I've hit everything in views. Unless uh, Matthias tells me I missed something, but I think we hit them all. So then we're going to move on to selecting lights. Seems simple, but there's a lot of depth there. So when it comes to it, let's see a couple questions. Yeah, so all the questions are in there, but the guys will get to them. How they're pretty simple. So selecting lights may seem as simple as just typing, you know, clear choice one through 10, enter, and you get your 10 lights, right? But there are a lot you can do to be able to, to get different selections to move really quickly in Onyx while you're building your groups, while you're live in a show. Uh, anytime you wanna select different groups and different settings of lights, there's a variety of really great tools here to do so. And so I wanna demonstrate some of that now. So first and foremost, if we're looking here on our keypad, we're able to go ahead and I'm going to resize this so we can see capture and I'm going to turn on a highlight. Because highlight just opens up the lights all the way so we can see them as we select things. Within the keypad itself, let's just move this around a little bit. In the keypad itself, we have the through plus minus um, commands. So if we don't have anything selected, we could type one plus two, enter, right? We could type one plus 10, enter, and get fixture one and fixture 10. But we can also combine the plus minus through commands. So we can go ahead and type one through 10 plus 18. And we're gonna get one through 10 and then only number 18. We can also do minus, which will deselect and say we wanna get rid of number 18 there. We hit that, we deselect just that fixture. If we wanna deselect everything we've got selected right now, we can hit clear once. Hitting clear twice again will be a full clear of our programmer. It's gonna clear out all the parameter information that we've brought into there, any presets we've pressed, et cetera, okay? So all of that would be cleared um, with a, a, a twice clear, but a once clear just clears our selection. We'll use that info still in the programmer. We also can do things like zero enter. So that deselects everything. So if we've got, that's really an alternative to clear, but it's there. So select some random fixtures. We hit zero enter. It's going to select deselect everything. Dot zero enter is going to select everything. Okay. So that's that's quicker to type than you know one through nine 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 at full, right? Or or one through in this case, we go over a thousand, you know, enter. It's quicker to just hit dot zero enter plus you don't have to think about it, right? <laughs> that's pretty key as well, because I don't always remember how many fixtures I have on a given show. Uh, when we're working with multi-part fixtures, we also have slice and range here at the top, which can help us. So as an example, I can select fixture 61 through 66. And by default, we get what's called range. Or Okay, so we do have, that's right, we have through 70. So maybe I go 61 through 61 through 70, right? So 61 through 70, enter. Boom, I get all those strip lights right through, okay? But these are a, a multi-cell unit. And so in this case, maybe I just want in each of these multi-part fixtures to select the, uh, the left half. So we've got two sizes here and they're not perfectly in order. It's okay, Bob, uh, we appreciate you. But, but, um, and I know why he did it, but that's okay. But for this example, if we pop this out of range mode and into slice mode, I can now type something like 63.1 through 66.3. And that now highlights, that now selects those three cells. So that it, the one, two, and three cells of lights 63 through 66. And so when you're working, especially when you're working with a lot of multi-cell fixtures, 
that makes it super easy to go, okay, I want the first cell of every fixture, you know, red. Then I go and grab, you know, so that was the first three cells of the fixture in red. Then I'll bring them to full in the master. So again, we're in slice mode. Let's, let's practice. So 63 through 66. Oops, it'd be 63.0, sorry, through zero. We get those guys. But I had lights selected here. So we would get those. Doesn't matter, we can bring them to full. And so now the first cells are red. Then we do uh, 63.4 through so four, five, six. 66.6, .6, and we make that guy magenta. Then we do 63.7 through 66.10. Now it's not a perfect grouping, and we make those guys amber. And so now we just quickly went, we selected across a whole range. This was four fixtures, but you could select across a much broader range of fixtures, you know, 100 or 200. And we selected just three cells at a time or just one cell at a time. Um, that's what slice versus range is gonna do. Um, if I did the same command here, 60, so that was 63.7 through 66.10. If I did that on range, here's what it would give me. Now it's giving me all the numbers, you know, numerically through there, which is different. That gives me just the last third roughly of the first fixture and then all of the next three fixtures. Not what I wanted in that situation. In other situations, sure, that's what I'd want. So when you're working with multi-part fixtures, you definitely want to have a slice and range around. And you wanna be using them because it's gonna help you build things really quick. The other thing that's gonna help you select things really quick is called the grouping tools. Okay, you can get some really similar functions out of that. So say, for example, I select 63 through 66. Okay, now I'm going to hit grouping. I get the grouping tools to pop up. Now, the grouping tools is here in the top of the fixture and group windows. You can have it pop out of the sidebar, and you can also select it in a slightly different format through the grouping tab on the encoders. Okay, so you can find it in all three places. Um, but the function's the same no matter where you get it. Um, also, sometimes you accidentally hit deselect. 63 through 66. The grouping tools allows us to do similar things like we were doing with slice and range, okay? Where we can go ahead and we have in the top here the mode, off every block divide mirror group, okay? And as you can see, each of those made my lights flash in different ways. I've got highlight on so we can see them. So in every, it says, you know, every, and then we have a value of two. So every other is, every two is every other fixture rather. But you can do every three. And the way that this can really speed you up is you can go, say we turn off highlight, and uh, we just bring these guys to full. And then we do every two, so we do red, and then we hit next and we go at full, and then we do cyan, okay? And then we do next, and we're back to the light that we did red, okay? And so now we've got our two sets of lights here, and we've put them in some different colors here. And we're able to do that to be able to quickly and easily just assign some, we'll do preset name here, a red cyan and have it on every other fixture and do it quick, okay? Now, grouping tools aren't just fun to go in here and select some lights and then hit grouping, but we can also go and record this to a group. I'll do it under seven baton. And so now we see this little E2 in the corner. That stands for every two. That's a grouping tool filter. And so what that looks like is now if I clear and I reselect this, I've now selected those same lights. So 63 through 66. But my grouping tools is also in there with the every two value. It's already selected in there. So maybe before in other consoles or in Onyx, you would go ahead and you would create 
um, a, a group with every other fixture and call it half and then do another one and call it, you know, other half. Here, you can just do it all in one group. And then you just hit next to go between them. And so I just go at, you know, full, and then I hit it with color, and then I go next, I go full, and then I hit it with another color. Boom. Or did I do them both the same color? Yeah, here's a split color. Um, a little hard to see because these are so bright. Um, but we can dim them down in a second. So we can dim them down now because I'm controlling them. Just do 25% there. And you're able, you're able to change those colors on every two. Um, besides every two, though, we, we've got a lot of other options. And, and you really can do a lot of cool stuff in here. So say, for example, I just select my darts here. They're pretty easy to see. And go here, I could do every two. By doing three color stuff, I could do every three, okay? I can also do block. So now my first two light up, and then as I hit next, I'm just gonna hit it on my console. Blocks of two go through, which doesn't do wonders for this left for this layout, but it works. Block can be really helpful if you have a multi-element, a multi-part LED fixture, or like a blinder, uh, which most of them are LEDs these days. I um, mean, you have a two cell blinder, right? That's got two lights. You hit every two and now you're controlling one light at a time, okay? Divide. Divide is cool because unlike every in block, you're now dealing with the whole and applying the math that way. So instead of every two, which is just every other fixture, you're now looking at everything selected and you're going, thank you, Bob, by the way, for giving me center fixtures on this, because um, that helps. Please, there's center fixtures, yeah. You, you are dividing the whole selection, however many that is, by two. So you know that's half, right? And then I'll hit my next on my console and I get my other half in order, um, in, in selection order. So in this example, it's not that exciting, but in other examples, it's more exciting. Like if I were just to select, you got two-way selection here. Try to select just that one truss, divide by two, then half, 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 half. Boom, done. Okay. Then we have mirror. So this takes the outside two. Next, next, next coming inside, right? So that's a mirror. For example, if I do uh, grab those guys again, this two way stuff is so cool, but I'm not used to it. Not used to working with it. If I did four, now I would get the two outermost and then the two um, innermost, okay? And so that's helpful as well. And then group, if I have multiple groups selected, like here, I'll clear. I'll just select a few groups here. Now I go to grouping tools by group. Set my mask value to, uh, why is that not happy? Now it's happy. Now I'm getting one group at a time. Group one, group two, group three, group one, group two, group three, group one, group two, group three and just firing through those groups. Now, this is helpful when you're assigning colors, assigning positions and whatnot, but it gets even more helpful when we turn on this fan plus effects. Because what that does is it now allows the effects to apply to that grouping tool. So now every other fixture does an effect when we do effects, or if we're doing fanning, the fanning is going to apply in that way as well. So just as an example here, we'll go to tilt. Go to fanning and we've got fan effects on we're on every two and so here now when i move the fanning you may be able to see that every other fixture tilts forwards and every other fixture tilts backwards it's doing it in every other fixture instead of if i turn that off it's going to do that left to right, where the left most ones, left most ones, excuse me, go one way, and the right left, the right most ones go the other way. And so it's really quick and easy to just grab an every two, throw the fan effects on it, fan it, and get some cool stuff. Like as an example, let's just go actually tilt, forget we were fanning, turn our every two back on. Okay, it's on, fan effects is on. This time we're gonna go to color, and, but we're in highlight. It's always highlight. Somebody said that yesterday. <laughs> so we turn everybody to blue. 
and then we click red, go to fanning, and make sure that our fan effects is on our mask value of two. And now we fanned half of ours to a, a more reddish and the other half is, a, is, a, is, a, is just blue. And we just did it half the rig every other, just like that, nice and quick. Um, so the grouping tools can really do a lot for you in that regard, especially when you turn the fan slash effects on because then it's applying the fan within that, um, which is very cool. Also at the bottom here, we have actions. So these are sorting actions, okay? Most notably, random. So randomize the selection for the grouping tools. Um, that's gonna randomize how they go. That's it, This is not only if we have a mask, even if we're off and we hit random, we're now getting a random selection, okay? And so when you're working with effects, especially you want an effect to be random, just hit, you know, random. You can even store it as a group. It's going to store it as the selection order that, that it's currently got, which is randomized. Okay. And then you can apply effects to that group. It happens in a random fashion. You can revert. That goes back on your last action. Invert flips your action. So if you select these spots and then you do every two and then you invert, you get exactly the opposite. You get the less of the rest of the rig selected. Then you get only the part you had, then the rest of the rig, then only the part you had. You can invert the mask. So if you've got every two, that's gonna flip to the other every two. It's the same as hitting next basically. Um, but if we do like a mask of three, then it's just gonna invert that from the first to the last fixture. We can resort. So that puts the, the fixtures back in order uh, numerically by the fixture number. And we can also flip, reverse it, okay? So that's great if you're doing an effect or applying a fanning, it's going left to right. You want it to happen right to left instead. Reverse back to what you were doing, you're done. Okay, life's good. Um, there also are the masks on this other side. So that's the opposite, editor and masks. And the masks are just predefined stuff. So you see here, we did our every two, it's here in mask, or maybe we grab our every four, pop over to the editor, that's what's selected. So nothing fancy, it's just, they, they're pre-dialed in, you can hit them real quick and be off to the races, right? Mirror per two, select that. Now we're in mirror per two, done, okay? Um, so those are the grouping tools. A lot of great stuff in there, guys. Similarly, just while we're here with selecting lights, um, we can load things. So let me actually undo. So undo in, in Onyx is a programmer undo. Okay, that means that we are undoing the change we made in the programmer. So everybody's blue here. I'm gonna record this to a playback. Got a cue list here. Awesome. And so now that we've got a playback here, I can clear this out, hit play. Let those fade in. And we're able to load in a variety of ways. Okay, that's bringing our values into the program so we can work with them and then record them in different ways. And so what that's gonna look like, there's a variety of things, uh, different ways to do things. And I just like to run through them. So first of all, if we are um, selecting, if we want to load a group, like for example, just our spots, I've got highlight on, so it'll show us what we're doing as well. I can press load, I can press group, one, my group number, enter, okay? Then I get, only my first group here, my spots, which those, these are the ones that are in the show file. The Artista da Vinci's are the ones we cloned in that aren't in the capture file. We've loaded into the programmer all of their info. They're not selected right now, but all their info is in here. Everything about that light is in here. Okay, there's a few other ways we can load. For example, we can press load load. That's one of my favorites. So load load is going to load every attribute of the light, every parameter, that is not at its default setting, okay? Not at its default setting. And that's a key there. So anything that's at the default setting that's not being changed otherwise by a queue um, is not going to get loaded, okay? And so what we can do there is, is bring all everything in. This can be really great if you have mixed a couple faders together or film and TV guys, I know you're on here. Um, I, in the past year, I've done some film and TV stuff, which, uh, you know, previously I hadn't done a lot of that, but, you know, the pandemic uh, comes along and you do film and TV stuff, right? Um, and 
and um, you know you're able to go ahead and just you know load load you know if you had some submasters or other things controlling the lights you're now loading your values into the programmer record it give it a name you know you can call that back now later as needed okay uh, if we do want to load like everything like okay this is going to include defaults and everything we can press zero dot or sorry dot zero let me clear dot zero not zero dot load load I believe that was correct let's find out yep and we get everything defaults and everything um no that was not right it was it is zero dot yeah, and that's everything including default. See, it was right on my notes. I shouldn't double, I shouldn't second guess myself. You can get everything including default presets all brought in there. We can also selectively load. This is cool. So like I've got these guys here and I've got them in this blue. And sure, I built that with the preset, I think. Let's find out. Go to our queue list values here. I did not, I was bad and I didn't build it with the preset. That was not good. I shouldn't have done that. Um. And so I can load that color in. So I can take these lights and say I go ahead and I click, I bring up my parameters here. Okay, I select the spots maybe. And then I go in here and I just say um, load color. And maybe I just wanna load the whole parameter group. Okay, I can right click here, I can load everything. I can right click here, I can load some of the things. I can go, let me just go uh, group one, oops, group one, enter. I can load and I can load a single parameter, okay? So I can load and I can filter just intensity and then hit group one. And with the filter engaged, I now only get intensity group parameters. So that's intensity and shutter. I could do that with color. I could do that with whatever I'd, I'd like. So that way I've got this look on stage that I've built with different faders or whatnot. And I say, you know, I wanna pull out of that just the color, just the intensity. I can do that there with load. Um, let's see, load, we can also for individual parameters. So that was, you know, we were right clicking here or we were loading and hitting the parameter group, but we can also right click on any of these guys and we can load there, okay? We can also press load. And, um, and, and do those groups, as I mentioned here. We can load base, we can do effects only, we can do swing only from effects, we can load time values as well. Um, so there's a lot of things in there, a lot of good stuff. Just ways to think about, um, basically, uh, the, the homework on this is if there's any portion of programming that you want to ever load from, there is probably a way to do it and it is doable and it's gonna save you time, right? Um, and ultimately that's what we wanna do, okay? Um, just another example is if we go, okay, so we've got, um, you know, these strip lights on the ground, they're not doing anything. So maybe I press load um, fixture and then I do one through 10 at, and then it was uh, 61 through 70 were those strip lights. So what this command is saying is it's, it's, it's like a partial clone. So earlier we did cloning, we cloned a whole fixture. You know, this was in the patch, clones everything to a new fixture. But maybe I just have some stuff and, you know, I, there's so many times when a show producer has been like, okay, you know, the effect that those lights are doing on the ground, make the lights in the air do the same effect for this next portion, right? And you could do that with this. You would just load the fixture, select base and effects for effects um, in that particular example and load, you know, fixture numbers through other fixture numbers. And you press enter. And then you should see that come up. What did I type wrong? Load number at number. Load one at 61. Let me make sure I got the right number. Boom, and then it'll go. But that, for some reason, I am typing something wrong. Group load at. Group one load at group three, boom, and it loads across the different types. Um, there are also 
you can also load from a specific queue. And so that's a good point, just checking my notes here, is, um, is you've got, maybe you've got multiple queues active and you just wanna load things from one queue. That's okay, you can do that. So you can just load the fixture number. So say I wanna load fixture one through 10. And then you just type at Q, type a number. It's going to be the selected Q list, the one that's here. And then we'd press enter. And it loads those fixtures in the state that they're in, in that queue. So even if you have multiple queues running, you can bring it out of just that one queue. So instead of just loading fixture one through 10 and getting everything from all the queues they're in, you can get just what they're in um, from that example. And so that's, that is, uh, has a lot of, a lot of ways to load. Uh, one question that just came in that is very relevant is, um, can you load values from a queue if it is not active for an out of sequence program? Um, you know, I haven't, let's try it, you know? Um, so I'll take these guys, turn them saying, record a second queue and play it. You should be able to in theory. So let's uh, load one through 10 at Q1, enter, boom. Yep, loaded them from Q1, even though Q2 was active. Absolutely be who asked that. So yeah, totally uh, that is doable as well. Absolutely. Uh, can you select parameter cells in the programmer? You cannot, that's another thing that comes up from other consoles. Um, and uh, that unfortunately is not something you can do for a quick edit. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Um, now, a great other question just came through. I know I'm not supposed to look at the questions, but I just did. Um, is, are your notes available for downloads? So like where I just went through all of these loads, I just took this out of the manual, okay? I'm not gonna be, you know, I mean, I, I use these things too, but, but if you just go to support.obsidiancontrol.com and then you type in load, or go through the menu and find it using the load command is right here. And if we scroll down, it actually walks us through with these, uh, these little drop down deals, all of these different situations that I just did. Okay, so all this stuff's in here with pictures, with examples, you can follow all of these things to learn those later. And so that's totally doable. Um, I'm gonna pop ahead to our next topic here just so we make sure we get to everything today. Um, but uh, we will definitely, the guys are in there answering questions, or we may have some time at the end to answer additional questions as well. Um, so when it comes to clearing, or sorry, when it comes to loading, there's loading, um, but then there's also clearing. Actually, let me just move around something in my notes quick, because I think this ordering makes a little more sense. And so you can bring things into the programmer, and we've talked about clearing once to clear our selection, clearing twice to clear everything. Um, but ultimately, you're programming along, and there are going to be times where you don't want to clear everything. You just want to clear partial of things that are in your programmer. So we'll bring some things back into our programmer here. So we got all these lights in our programmer, and then we want to clear just some of them out. How do we do that? Or maybe we just want to clear out some of the attributes, right? Like we accidentally brought, um, intensity for one through 10 in here. And maybe we didn't mean to do that. So I would select group one enter. That's, that's fixture. I know that's fixtures one through 10. Oh, and it is thousand one through thousand ten because we cloned. Um, and there's a couple ways that I could get rid of intensity. Okay. First thing is I could right click and press clear on the intensity wheel. Okay. I can also um, hold the clear button on a console, tap the encoder wheel which I just did, okay? And, and you see that it clears. Um, so that that's, you know, the PC way versus the console way, right? There's the the uh, tap, okay? Um, and then, and you're able to clear that individual parameter. It gets cleared out of the programmer. Now you're not gonna record that into a queue accidentally, right? Um, we can also knock fixtures out completely. So say 1001 through 1010, I wanted to get rid of those guys. Totally can do that. So I'm just gonna press clear. And then I'm going to type 1001 through 10, 10. They're gone. They're selected still. So that's why they're showing up here right now because they are still selected in the programmer. 
but there's no information for them. So then I can go ahead and select something else, move on with what I was doing. You know, I'm good to go. Um, we can clear by group number. So, you know, clear, same process, same syntax, group one, enter, or maybe I'll undo that and hit the actual group tile. So clear, group one, those guys cleared out. Let me undo that again to get them back. Um, and then last but not least, we do have the good old clear enter, which is different than clear clear. And clear enter is just dealing with the selected fixtures. So now in my programmer, I had had intensity and color for these 20 movers. And then I also had these lights, uh, these strip lights. Now I just have the strip lights. I, I completely cleared out these selected fixtures. The difference between uh, the clear enter and clear within some fixture numbers is you don't really have to know the fixture numbers. You, you just have to have them selected. So they're selected and you're like, oh, I just want to clear out the things that are selected. You know, maybe you hit highlight on your console quick, you see the lights and you say, clear everything out for those guys, clear enter, done, okay? Um, clearing and, and doing so quickly is one of those things that can really help you in a show situation. So I highly recommend, um, you know, paying attention, rewatching this, reading the part on clearing in the manual because it's really gonna speed you up and get you moving faster. One of the things that was asked earlier that um, I have in my notes here now are defaults. So one of the things you're going to notice is say I stop everything, I stop all my cues and I go to an LED fixture. I go to these, these seven battens and I take them to full. They're automatically for color, even before I take them to full technically, but we can't see them. If I go to my parts units, um, these guys, oops, I got my masters in my parts units group. That's okay. Um, Cause we can just go over here to auto and to our parts, kick off the grouping tools. Um, we notice that red, green, blue, and white RGBW, you know, all of the colors generally red, green, blue, or generally red, green, blue, white. Like if there's other colors, um, they may or may not be at full, depending on who made the profile. I guess with these new capture, these uh, Alta Base, Atlas Base profiles, um, the whole thing's at full. So all your colors are at full by default for your LEDs that have a dimmer, okay? And depending on how you program, that may or may not be what you want. Similarly, maybe you want for default when you just clear everything. Um, I know a, a number of LEDs that do this where you'd like the moving heads to be pointing generally at the stage instead of straight up and straight down. Um, so can you modify that default? You absolutely can. Um, now, I do have to say the reason for the LEDs, just so you're aware um, before you do it, is so that from nothing, from straight patch or all the cues are stopped, you can just go and type the fixture number at full and you're gonna see light output, okay? But you can totally go in there and you know go ahead and just um, and change that so that the colors are not on automatically, just knowing that you'll have to give it intensity information and color to get output at first, okay? So, Quick note, actually, Will, on this, the new library also changes some of these rules. So before, when you had a fixture like uh, our fuse profile is RGBMA, it was only put an RGB to full and not the whole fixture. So the fixture actually wasn't fully outputting. With the new library, we revised all our <clears throat> default rules. So every additive LED is actually set to full if the fixture has a dimmer. So that uh, you know the fixture will turn on to its full brightness. You only have to have, I only have to worry about dimming control. Uh, if the fixture doesn't have a dimmer, then the LEDs will stay off. So it's actually smart to know when to put the LED channels to full or when not. Thanks, Matthias. Yeah, that was literally what I was just noticing. I was like, wait, usually only RGB are full, and that's because we're in a new library format now. Hey. hey. Um, so if you wanted those to be zeroed, like now I've zeroed, I've zeroed these out for uh, at least 63 through uh, 70 through, through these lights that are selected, um, you can bring them to zero. And then the default pop out, which of course I had on the sidebar and then I got rid of <laughs> when we were doing windows. So I'll just go to windows, programmer, default. We can pop this out. And then this is just a preset and it, it, it walks you through it right here. 
And so you can press record, press your default. You've now overwritten your default. And so like 63 was one of those fixtures. I'll select it. And then if I select like 63.1, I see, okay, now they're defaulting to off. So I've overridden that default. In here, we also have highlight and park presets. The highlight parset presets, especially are, are friends of mine. Um, really, all of them are. They're great. All this stuff's great. Let's walk through what they do. So if I go to my lights and uh, we clear everything out and we go ahead and go back to our groups, we grab our spots, grab all our spots right here, and we take them to full. And now we take them, we want to change the highlight preset. So maybe we go on the color and we turn them yellow when we've got them highlighted. We want to see them yellow when we use the highlight function. We can now go to default and record highlight one. Okay. Then I'm going to go to blue, maybe cyan just so it's a little brighter. Yeah, looks kind of greenish. We'll go to blue. Record default low light one. And then we see automatically previously um, use factory defaults was selected, but I want to select highlight one and low light one. Okay. Now we're going to clear out, show us our spots, highlight them. They're yellow. And if I hit next, it now shows me that as I'm highlighting across the row, the highlighted one turns yellow and the others that are selected but not presently um, active, those ones show up in the low light color. And so this can be really powerful. Um, it's, it's, I, I definitely recommend doing the, the highlight low light preset if you use highlight, which you should, um, because ultimately it, um, it saves you time and makes things less confusing than the just plain white highlight. I um, mean, you can put anything into these presets. It's not just intensity and color. You can do whatever you want, but the blue yellow works for me. Um, park is a command you may be familiar with, you may not, where you're basically overriding anything that's happening in the console and telling the fixture to stay doing whatever it was doing. So this is great if you've got some backstage lighting that like in a corporate show or just something that you need to stay on no matter what until the console shuts off, okay? And so it's the same process where you're just going to record to the park, um, record to the unpark to undo it, or you can unpark all, okay? So you can, you can press any of these. I'm um, sorry, not record. You just press them. I apologize. Um, and you're able to park things. Now that these spots are parked, see here, I get this big note that they're parked. And if I try to move them, I can move the value and I can see it in the programmer, but it's not going to move on the stage. It's not going to move on the DMX output because it is parked. Okay. But then I can go back here, unpark selected or unpark all if I want to unpark everything. And then we're good to go. No problems there. So park is really, if there's something that, you know, especially if it's like a light that you had to plug in for the client, but it's like down the hall in another room or something really obscure like that, you know, these things happen on, on real shows and, you know, you're like, okay, I just need this thing to stay on no matter what you can park it and it's going to do what it's doing. Something in the lobby, whatever park. Um, and the, the great thing about park and Onyx, of course, is that message that that super bright gray, you know, parked message. You can't miss it, right? And uh, you can always go in and unpark all to unpark your stuff. Um, and so that is how we park things. So now we've talked about through today's webinar, a good variety of things, right? We've built the 2D plan, we've built some presets, we've done some cloning, and we've really dived in to loading and selecting and clearing stuff so that we can work uh, a little bit better than the simplistic, just, you know, clear everything or load everything. Uh, we can do a lot more than that. Let's talk for a minute about editing cues that already exist, okay? Because, because when a cue already exists, I know when I was a young LD, I would often, if I had to fix something, delete the cue and then just rewrite it with something new. And you don't have to do that. That's, that's more work than you should be doing. Um, you, you know, there are ways to update these things and we're going to walk through them here. So I'm just going to go here. I'm just going to make a quick second cue. Say we turn everything amber in a queue. And then maybe we do a queue where we select um, 
select one through nine ninety nine. Return them to the band position. I know they're not on, but we'll record it. Right there. And then we'll clear that. We'll play these different cues together. And we get a nice look on our stage. And so now we wanna talk about editing cues. So right now we have multiple cues running. Right, and we talked about with load, if we wanted to load this, we could load, load. And now we've got the output of everything that's not at the default. And we could now go record that as a new queue. We'll do that quick. Name it. And then if I just go on the console quick, I play that one. It now stops the other three because they're completely overridden. And we only have this queue, right? But say we want to go ahead and we want to play these guys. So now these guys are all playing. There's our second one. Perfect. And for some reason, why did my, did my CITP just drop? No, it's working. Okay, we're good. Okay. Either way, I'm gonna go ahead here. Oh, there it is. That was, there was a funky, a little bit of funkiness there with capture for some reason. Uh, where it wasn't quite updated, but now we're there. Um, we can edit cues a variety of different ways. The first and the one that I probably use the most is just merging, right? I take my lights and I go, hey, I wanted these lights there, whatever color they are, and I wanted them to be yellow, right? Because that makes art. Um, I change the color, I go ahead and I could go, I select the cue that I want or not. I press record cue then press my queue number. So I'm in queue one here. And then my queue list, this one is selected queue list three and it says it at the top. So if I hit enter right now, it's going to merge to that queue list. Maybe I want to do to this queue list. I can click on it or, um, and I can go ahead and it's just going to merge in there. Okay. Um, now it merged in there. I think I still have my merge. Yeah. On here in case of conflict merge, I have that highlighted and saved in my save settings and that's why it merged automatically. Normally we'd record, this would come up. Um, now I just record a third queue cause I didn't put in the full syntax, but, and it would merge it in there. Once you do merge in, you can clear your programmer. Okay, so I just cleared the programmer, nothing moved, everything changed because the queue reloaded with the new merged content, everything's good to go, okay? There also is similar to merging the update function. The update function gets you the same result as merging, which I just showed you, but it has some advantages. So say I take the, the spots now and we take them to blue and I take the fuse SFXs or the fuse washes. Hope I didn't clone all these guys. That's right. That's okay. And I pop them in a nice blue. So I can pop out my color picker here. I know we didn't show this today. Pick a nice blue for those guys. Perfect. And so then I go ahead and I'm ready to put these into a new queue. And so I can press update or an existing queue that's playing. And I get some options here for updating. So what the update function does in the update key is it looks for anything that's playing, any queues that are playing that have the parameters in it for the lights that you are about to hit, about to record in, that you've brought into the program, okay? So the, the key with the update function is if you go in and select a new light that was not in that queue and you give it some parameters or you select a light that was in that queue, but you don't select the parameters that were in that queue and then you press update, this screen's going to come up blank. You're not going to see anything written in here. Okay. Um, but as long as the parameters and the light that you have just modified in the programmer are in the queue that's playing in any queue that's playing, those queues, any and all of those are going to show up in a list here as well as presets, okay? Because I just turned these lights blue, they're presently yellow in the program, right? If I hit preview here, my programmer goes to blind. In fact, I didn't show you guys this yesterday, um, but if I go in the wheels here and I go to rate and set a live time, like a nice one second fade, and I go between preview, blind mode, and programmer, it does fade, gives us a nice smooth fade between the two. Great for during show programming of things you forgot, um, and so, you go in there and you can choose, okay, 
do I want to update the queue list? Like this one, everybody blue is what's playing. These lights are in it. They have the color information. Is that what I want to update? Or do I want to update the color yellow? Because these lights are yellow. They're following the yellow preset in that queue. And so maybe I just tweak the yellow and I want to tweak it everywhere that that preset is. Then I would choose the preset. Okay. Now you can choose any combination. You can choose presets. You can choose cues. You can choose both of them. Okay. You just want to be smart with the update function. Early on in my career, um, this was spoken to me very wisely by, by my boss at the time. And he said, hey, you know, use the update function. It can help you. But if you're working quick, you're under the gun, you're sweating, and, and you know, you're programming away, you hit update. If you don't look quickly and make sure the cues you're updating are what you actually want to update, you could be in a world of hurt in a minute. Okay? And so he was a big fan of of using the record queue one type syntax where you merge into the queue um, because then he knew the destination he was going to was exactly what he wanted. The update function does work great. And most of the time, everything works perfect. But just look at the list here. Make sure you're updating what you think you're actually updating. Because if you accidentally update something else, um, it's not as easy to go back and fix that <laughs> later. And so once you've chosen what you like, you can hit enter and now you've updated. Same as that merging, um, except with update, I don't have to clear my programmer. It's already been cleared for me. It's already live in the active queue. Life is great. Life is good. Okay. Now we talked about updating there. I was talking about, okay, we can update away um, and we can update that preset. So right now the lights, let's see what they're doing. So I can go to queue list values here, Q1, and I see one through 10 are in the blue preset. Okay. Very cool. We are recording. Okay, guys, thank you all for that. And thank you, Bob, for calling me um, because <laughs> oh, and Matias called me, but dude, I was so focused. <laughs> I was just talking away, ignoring my phone because that's what you do during a webinar. Okay, updating. So the update function, we love it. So it looks for um, in your queues, um, it looks for, I'm just going to catch up for a minute because, you know, I was going to town teaching you guys and I was like, man, nobody's talking, nobody's asking any questions. Um, so update, the update function looks, did you guys see me merge into a queue that was existing? Sorry, Bob. Um, I don't think we got there even. So either. I didn't update. I was busy answering questions as you kind of faded into the um, oblivion. Yeah, you were like, what happened to David? Did he pass out over there? Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> and so, um, oh, and my little webcam's doing its thing. Okay, so. Uh, when it comes down to it, um, there are multiple ways that we can update queues in the console that we're able to go ahead and, um, okay, Ted says that we were on merge and we got to the actual update function. Great. Okay, thank you for that info, guys. So merge is one way. Um, a merge is a great way that you can, if you know exactly what queue and you're only updating a single queue that you want to update, use a merge. A merge can be great, but update can be good as well. Um, so one update does is say we take uh, these spots one through 10 and in this queue, they are, I believe in blue and we switch them to yellow. Okay. Now we want them in this blue, this queue that's active and there's multiple queues active right now. Um, we want them to switch to this yellow because we brought that in the programmer. We hit update and we get the update window. Okay. Um, this is, this is key to look at. So on the right here is going to be all the queues that, could possibly pertain to um, what you're updating, okay? And so what that looks like is, um, you know, anything that's active that has that fixture in it with the parameters that you've adjusted, at least some of them, you can, um, one trick you can do if something isn't showing up in update is you can touch a parameter that's in that queue and then add some others that aren't. Um, and then you can get the queue to show up here, but it's looking for queues that are playing, that are active, that have those parameters in them, okay? Um, and so that is key. And, um, and then it also has presets on the left. Um, you can update presets here, but in this case, I took the lights from the blue preset to the yellow preset. If I select this right here, it's going to turn these lights yellow in the blue preset. Not what I want to do here, um, but it is part of the update function that you can do. So you select the cues you want, you hit enter, they're now updated. Okay. Notice my clear light on my, my command keypad has gone away. My programmer's clear. 
So update function takes care of that. It not only merges into that queue, it clears the programmer, re, you know, fires that queue, makes it live, everything. So this is the kind of thing you can use while a show is going to update something and, uh, and be good to go, okay? Um, exactly. So, so that, that is the, the update function. The only warning I have for you with update, and I feel like I just said this three minutes ago, is watch carefully the list of queues that it brings up when you hit update. Um, if you've got a lot of queues running and you've brought multiple things into your parameter, there may be queues in there that you don't mean to update that will get updated with new stuff when you hit update. Um, so just be careful. Make sure you select only what you want to update because if you do update the wrong thing, you're then going to have to re-update that queue to fix it again later. And nobody wants to re-update. You only want to do it once. This stuff's supposed to save us time, right? Uh, but so the update function is great. Um, I personally use the merge function a lot just because early on in my career, my boss um, who taught me a lot about moving light programming, you know, he was, he was one of those guys that was like, you can use update, but be careful because it's messed me up so many times. And that's if you don't pay attention to the list of cues that comes up, you know, and you update, you know, your stage wash and you turn off half the lights or something, right? You didn't mean to do that. And the next time you go to play it, you, you're kind of caught with your pants down. You don't want that. Um, and so... And so merging, updating, both totally valid options. Just be careful with the update function. Um, you can also uh, load queues if you want, okay? So you can uh, load queue to say, oops, sorry, queue to load. And that's gonna take you to queue two as well. Okay, and so that's an option as well. Um, one question that I just saw, yeah, is there an undo function? So undo in Onyx is a programmer um, status undo only. And that 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 is something that you think about with load, right? Because you're like, if I accidentally loaded the wrong thing, um, would I be able to undo that? And you can't undo that record, okay? Yeah, so that's, that's very important. The undo function is only going to bring stuff back in the programmer that you had previous, um, which is helpful, but it's not going to undo a, a misrecord or a miss... Um, an accidental merge um, with the update function that, that didn't go quite right. So uh, yeah, do be careful with that. Um, let's see. Um, awesome. So fanning, here's the, the uh, other thing I've got on my notes here at the end of the webinar. Um, I'll let the guys get to a couple of the questions that are in there are, um, can you fan, for example, Matthias was throwing this one at me, is fanning without the fanning tool. What? Yeah, and we're going to get more into this uh, on the next one with uh, timings and stuff, but you absolutely can. So say, for example, I select a group here, such as the, uh, is this the spots in the front? It is. And I then go to a color. So here's cyan's full, but magenta's at zero. I could then go, actually, I'll take all my colors to, to zero. And then here on cyan, I could go and type add. I could tap my parameter, which I, I clicked on it here. I could also tap the encoder wheel. And then I can type zero through 100 through zero. What this does is it brings in cyan on those lights, okay, or red for the RGBs. Um, and and it does so, of course, did it across all 20 lights because I have 20 lights selected. Um, let me just redo that quick so it's more clear for us here. So one through 10 only. And then we go pull up our color here. And we've got red, green, and blue. So it's, we're just going to zero all of them. And then on red, we're going to go at, tap my parameter. This time I actually tapped the encoder wheel, but I could also click here zero through 100 through zero, enter. So now we've got across our whole lights here, we've got a fanning without the fanning tool where we've just entered a manual uh, percentage from zero to full um, from outside to center. Now we take blue, maybe we do the opposite. So again, at blue, this time 100 through zero through 100, enter. And then green is on, and we're just going to turn green off. 
is upside down. I don't know. And so now what we've got across these lights is where on the ends, they are, um, they are red at full, um, which is actually 0%. And then in the middle, the red is zero and the blue is exactly the opposite. So we get this cool, um, we get this cool fanning effect on those guys. And so that is a absolutely cool thing that you can do. Just a quick way, if you are typing, you like to type along, um, you can go ahead and be able to fan those guys out like that and be able to get that stuff done. Yeah. And so um, I'm seeing some questions here about delay and fade presets on other things. So this is actually the good news here about today is, um, is we've, we've covered the content that we wanted to cover, which is great because yesterday we didn't quite cover everything. So I wanted to make sure we didn't run into that today. Um, and so now I'll take questions unless uh, there's something that Matthias is like, hey, make sure you cover this. Or maybe my phone will ring and everybody will say you're not here. Um, um, yeah, but, um, but yeah, so a delay range or, or, or fade range, um, you can do that as well. That's a really cool thing that uh, we're going to cover tomorrow, but I don't mind covering that now since we have a little bit extra time. And so in, here in Onyx, we have fade and delay here on our programmer keypad, okay? And then we go ahead and we just type, click fade or delay, whichever we wanna do. And so we hit delay and then we can do our fanning. So we can do one through, you know, five through one, just like we did with the color fan, enter. Now in our programmer, we're gonna see that delay. Now we can see that's across every parameter, okay? We could also set delay and then we're gonna hit um, the color group and only do that for color, okay? But either way, we've set that delay here for everything. And so maybe we do intensity at full, pan tilt, we do to a uh, fan and then color, we go to red. And we record that to a new queue. We call it a fan example. And so now we've recorded that timing in there. We also can record into the timing of, um, we can record that timing into a preset and recall it later. So maybe I go record and all I want is time here. So in the record pop-up, I go ahead and, and uh, select only time. And then I could select only certain parameters if I wanted as well for the time. And then I go ahead and uh, now in the presets, I have to do all the parameters I'd want. And so what I like to do if I'm just doing a general like sweep that I wanna save, I'll just do all the parameters and stick it in the corner. And then we've done that, we've got time in there, okay? And so there's a lot you can do with this. And so just as an example, I'm gonna clear all my cues here, snap release on the surface, and then play back this example where the outermost fixtures are fading in first, the innermost were taking the entire five seconds where it was left to right. Oh, that's right, because I had the, uh, the cloned fixtures in there as well. Absolutely. Um, other questions that have come, feel free to ask questions here, guys, because we can, we can take some general questions and then I'm also gonna kind of go through the record pop-up a little more, okay? So one question I just saw was, how do you initially select the fixtures to fan the color? So when we did a fan and we did it through the command line, um, all we did was type, um, we just typed the um, one through 10 as our fixtures, enter. And then we go ahead, we've got those selected or maybe we selected them via group. We selected them any way that we'd normally select. And then we can type at and type uh, the parameter, you know, like color, red, one through 10, enter. Um, in theory, you should be able to, and we're going to go over the fade in detail tomorrow for sure, um, the, the delay in fading, because, you know, we've got literally 15 minutes here um, till it's over, and I want to go over more than 15 minutes of stuff. So I, I just said tomorrow, but I mean Tuesday on the next webinar. I want to go over more than 15 minutes worth of stuff with delay and fade presets and using that. Um, I, I don't want to sell it short because there's there's a lot of depth in there that you have. 
So feel free to use the Q&A um, to ask some questions here and we'll go ahead and, um, and record that and uh, record that and answer those, those questions there. Um, for example, Chris Steele just asked, but please do use the Q&A. Um, in the previous example, we removed a pro parameter value from the fixtures in the programmer. If you would merge that into a queue, would it write a zero or null value? So if I removed something from the programmer, it's now no longer in the programmer. I deselected, I removed that, I, I right clicked and cleared here, or use one of the other ways to remove things from the programmer. Once I do that, it's not going to record that into the queue. It's not, okay? Um, even if you see sometimes like after you record a queue, I'll just do it here. They're grayed out in the programmer. That means they're inactive. And so when I go to record again, right here, I have these options, source active or source active and inactive. By default, the stuff that's inactive that's in here is not going to record into a new queue, but I can hit the button and make that stuff record in there. Um, and so that that is available. Absolutely. Okay, cool. We've got some good questions here coming in. Great. Um, so Mar Marcin says, what type of effects preset do you recommend for fixtures like uh, BIK10s? Um, so we're going to talk about effects a lot on Tuesday, Marcin, and I don't want to sell it short. Um, you know, and, and actually next Thursday too, in the Dylos webinar, we're going to go over the pixel mapping functions, the console too. And so, um, you know, there's a lot you can do with a multi-part fixture like that, right? And I can't just in like two minutes explain that, right? I can't just explain you through like, um, you know, here's what I do because there's a lot of really cool options, especially with the pixel mapping as to what you could do. Um, could you show the group every and record uh, like that group 20 again? Sure. So if I'm recording to a group and I wanna record a grouping tools in it, all I do, select my lights, I can select them from a group, I can select them from the fixtures tab. I can type in any normal selection. Then I select the grouping. I do say every two, every three, every four, whatever I'd like. Maybe for this one, I just do a random selection because I'm going to use this for fanning or for an effect layer. Then I go ahead. I'll just do the every two so we can see it, the every four so we can see it. Then I'll go ahead and press record, record a group. It's, it's no different from a normal uh, group record, except I see in the corner the little E4 that stands for every four, but if it was you know block of two, it would say B2. Just up in that upper right corner, you, you see that indicator that says, okay, there's a grouping tool attached to this as well, um, and it's good to go. Um, and so that is uh, how you do that. On the parameters, how do I make it where the full center and zero options are on there? So Luke, um, probably what's going on here is there are in the cog here in this wheel, there is the ability to set the sizing of this, okay? So there's minimum, then there is medium, and there is maximum. And it will go between minimum and medium on, um, on uh, automatically based on your screen size, but you can also change that. So you probably don't see that. Maybe your screen size is a little bit uh, is a little bit tight, um, and uh, that's why that's not showing up. But you can you can make it show up. Uh, Petters is uh, is talking about BPM effects, and I just hit that. I want to answer that live. Um, so we're not going to do that right now because in the next webinar we're covering effects. Um, Let's see, can we use preset timing in a live situation? Yes, we can. Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. You absolutely can. Oh, yes, Chris Steele. So you sometimes you miss things and I appreciate you putting this in here. So when I'm going to record something, there is a, a option in there that I didn't go over in removing. And that is a great point that I missed. So say I play this cue back, this everybody blue, okay? And that's of course got these spots in yellow and maybe I don't want them to have any color at all, okay? There's a couple options here. So I can select them. Maybe I just hit blue or I, I throw them in a color. I press record and then, um, and then Q1. 
I don't have my merge conflict um, enabled. So I hit this and now I get some options here. And one that's really cool that's in here is the um, remove these values from the queue. So what I did right before I got here, just to recap, because this is important, is that uh, is I've selected these lights and I've selected color. And then I've pressed record queue and then I press one because it was Q1. And that queue that I'm merging into has color for these lights, okay? It has color information in them. That color information in the clue, in the, in the queue rather, is yellow. It's from the yellow preset and it is actually yellow. So I'm gonna hit remove these values. And then I've got the ability to remove them based on simple or based on exact. Now, simple means um, I chose color. I chose that same parameter, remove the color. Exact means I need to have picked that yellow preset or the exact same percentage yellow in order to remove that. More often than not, I use simple, right? But you can go in here and say you selected 10 lights, half of them were yellow, half of them were blue, and you selected the yellow preset. You, you did the remove and you hit exact, it would only remove it from the five that matched exactly. Okay, so I do that and then I can clear. And now I see these lights are now white. They were blue or they were yellow. Sorry, I hit the blue preset. I hit, I removed it there with that uh, recording and now they're white. Now I've removed that information from the queue, which is super helpful um, as well as, uh, it's not in groups, sorry. It's, yeah, it's only in queues, just double check to that there. And so that is a great way to remove things. Thank you, Chris, for reminding me of this thing because I use that on shows all the time. And yeah, you don't notice it, but it's it's super helpful to pull things out of a queue so that if you have a queue, you know, the biggest uh, application for that is you're going along doing your show and there's a queue that you accidentally put intensity in for some fixtures. You didn't want intensity to be there and it causes them to jump or to, you know, change the intensity when you didn't want it. You can just remove that and then you're good to go. It's now not in there anymore. Absolutely. <laughs> Chris said, I never believe I just never saw the random section. I can't believe it. Yeah, the random section is great. Um, can we show how to clone again? Sure, we can walk through that super quick again. If there's a couple more questions, we've got a couple minutes left. But cloning is in the patch. And all we do, it's in the cloning tab, but we actually first access it with the command clone fixture which we can hit press here from commands clone fixture. Or if you're on a console, you can type the actual copy key. And then the key here is source at target enter. That's how things work in Onyx, okay? And what that means is we go copy. Okay, so what fixture do I want to copy? Okay, uh, what fixture do I want to copy here? I want to copy fixture one. Oops. And then at what do I want to copy fixture one to? Maybe I want to copy it at 10 through 19. Enter. Now it's brought in here. Now it's going to clone that over once I hit execute commands. You can clone different types of fixtures to each other. Um, no problem. It's the console is going to do the best it can, right? If, it, if they have the same features or features that are similar, both have color mixing, whatever, you're going to get that clone over um, and, and it's going to work perfectly. Uh, somebody asked about swap. So swap is just like cloning. Um, and so it's in commands here. It's, it's, it's the same type of syntax. Sorry, I accidentally clicked an extra thing there. And you can press swap fixture and then one at, at, and then the thing popped up, but I got rid of it. So you can go swap. I usually don't do it this way. Um, one, and then you hit at. And then this comes up, you can select your fixture type, use fixture type. It walks you through what you're about to do before you commit, you hit execute, it happens. But you can also go the way that I usually do it is just select the type field here. It brings up the same dialogue for as many fixtures as you select, change the type, use type, boom. Then it comes up in the swap tab, you hit execute, it happens. Awesome. Just looking over the questions here in the last couple of minutes. Uh, 
why have you not used the edit Q1 syntax for updating? That's that's a great point. That's another great syntax for editing. You know, that's that's what I do love about the webinar format as well, too, is we all have our ways of working. Um, but yeah, you can edit Q1, enter. That brings the queue into the programmer, okay? Now, this programmer is a little bit different than your normal programmer. You see at the top here, it has the queue number in it, the queue list number, the queue name and number. And so now, anything that I'm bringing into the, the programmer, you know, anything I'm doing here, all of that info is being brought into the programmer, okay? And then when I go ahead and hit update, all the magic happens. Um, so it clears the programmer, it updates the queue because it was already playing and it, you know, refires that queue. You're ready to roll. You're now good to go. You can clear your programmer. You're done. Yeah, so that's that's yet another way to update. There are so many. Uh, the the uh, gentleman or whoever whomever was talking about swap asks about mapping parameters between swapped fixtures. So whenever you clone or swap fixtures, you definitely want to be using presets to build your queues because then you can just update those presets on the new fixture and it's going to go ahead and then update any queues created for that preset. So in that regard, you can do things like switching from a color wheel to a color mixing system um, and things that wouldn't normally clone well because they're just plain different, but they both apply to color. You could you can bridge that gap within a color preset, right? You can just go, okay, I had a color mix. Now I've cloned in a fixture that's colored wheel. I just go on the fixture, go to the color wheel. I find the color that best matches for each preset and I can record it in there. And then it's brought into the queues as well. And it's good to go. Awesome. Awesome. The other questions here are um, either ones, things we can't do or things we're going to cover tomorrow. Um, so thank you guys so much uh, for, for being here today. We'll go through once again real quick since we're here. Just go through where to get more help, where to find more info, um, because there's so many good resources out there for Onyx that the team provides. So you've got the main Obsidian Control uh, dot com website, which is the main hub of everything. From there, you're going to find the manual. So a lot of these things like, you know, we went over all those different load functions and all those different commands, and there's a lot of them, right? And you may not use all of them in the day to day. But if you want to go check them all out, go in the manual and look at load, and they're all right there. And you can practice them. And you can go and you can start to really commit them to memory. Um, and, and find which ones suit your style of programming um, the best way, right? Because um, ultimately, that's the way to do it. Then there's the forums. Again, searchable. So if you have a question about programming or effects or whatever, or load, uh, you could type load into the, the question and see if anybody else has asked that question before. They probably have. Um, you can, if you run into a bug or a problem, you can ask for support on the forums. Facebook group, you can hear about stuff like this. You can ask people questions, see what kind of shows people are doing, et cetera. Um, and then there also, hopefully in the future again, we'll get back to live trainings. And uh, that is that is what we've got, guys. Uh, so thankful to have you guys all on the webinar today. Um, it's been great talking to you. It's always a blast. Uh, just as a preview for next Tuesday, we are going to talk about networking. So that's one thing we haven't really talked about thus far. Now we're going to look at some examples of networking setups and how to do it both on the consoles and on the PC. We're going to talk about some networks of base and some basics of networking. You know, for those of you guys who might not have used networking a lot before, we're going to walk through some basic stuff. Um, we're going to talk about those delay and fade presets and embedded presets, move in black. Um, we're going to talk about effects and all the different playback types and how they work, especially the cube blender, because that's one that takes more time, right? Um, that's one that takes more time to explain. Uh, and uh, we'll also talk about a couple more things. Um, so really excited to have you guys. I hope you join us on uh, Tuesday if you can. If you can't, it's going to be recorded just like this one hopefully worked. And, um, and we will see you guys then. Thank you guys again so much for hanging out. Um, 
if uh, Matthias Rabat wants to chime yeah, in. Quick note yeah. for the Dylos one. For yeah. sure, you're going to need the um, beta 4.5 working on your laptop for that. Yeah. Um, we really have to use uh, Capture to preview all these fun things we do. Without seeing it, you would really not understand what is going on uh, inside Dylos. So please get this installed, get it working. If you have any questions, issues, uh, email us on support at obsidiancontrol.com and we'll be happy to set this up for you. But you will not really not be able to attend the webinar without the um, beta version uh, installed and up and running. So I just want to point that out. Um, not everyone actually that was in the beginner and intermediate has signed up for the advanced or dialogue one. So please make sure you click on that uh, as well. So we know how many people will be in it. Uh, it'll be the same login. The version that we're going to use is either 4.5, 12.05 or 12.06. We may actually put another one out by then. What? <laughs> what? I love yeah. Keep improving, you know, updating uh, the library every day. There's a new library built now. So things, uh, you know, come along. Awesome, everybody. Well, thank you for hanging out again. Like Matthias said, you really don't want to miss the new Dialos stuff. If you haven't tried it out in these beta versions at all, you don't want to miss that webinar. Even if you have tried it out, you don't want to miss that webinar because uh, some of the things you can do now, there's things that make your life a lot easier to make different effects and stuff. And there's things that enable you to do things you've never been able to do before. Um, and so it's really powerful and you definitely want to check it out. Thank you guys all for hanging out today. We'll, we'll see you guys next week. Have a great day.